Christos uh, project was to develop, as I mentioned earlier, in Cyprus, uh, a research group, a research center, which is going to concentrate on uh, structural safety of buildings and, and infrastructure, the disaster risk reduction, and the post-disaster management. So that was the intention of the proposal. This is the result of the project that uh, we are uh, talking about. And uh, of course, this is achieved through a collaboration, through a collaboration with our partners. Um, locally, yeah, the partners is uh, Frederick, Frederick Research Center, Frederick University. <coughs> Local uh, partners also the Cyprus University of Technology. And uh, our international partners, the uh, University of Naples, <coughs> Federico Segundo, and uh, the Aristotle University uh, of Thessaloniki. So it's a, it's a very good group with experiences in, uh, in this area, and naturally uh, we invited them to participate in this, in this effort. So as I said, uh, the partners for this project is FRC, CUT, uh, University, uh, University of Thessaloniki and University of Naples, the Derigo Segundo. So um, in retrospect, uh, the way, from where we started, um, we got together with uh, uh, Nicolas Kiragidis from uh, CUT, and uh, we did have competencies. We could do things in structural analysis, retrofitting, materials, uh, optimization, or health monitoring. So we did have this group competencies, but uh, nothing in this direction of natural hazards. So as I said, we called the recovery the, from uh, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, who, and the team of Professor Dilagis, who have experience in vulnerability and risk assessment of buildings, infrastructure, cultural heritage for different natural hazards. And also the team of Professor uh, Zuccaro from the University of Naples, Federico Segundo, which uh, have also expertise in impact assessment of natural hazards, impact distribution in time and space, and the cumulative effects given by cascading effects. So just by that, uh, we, uh, we know that this is a quality group and course for us that was uh, very helpful and eventually as a result of this project is now what we call is TOS, it's a research group established in Cyprus of course and all these uh, partners that I mentioned earlier have a, a part in a, a say in the operations. Um, some of the objectives, I, I don't want to take too long for this, but um, we wanted to concern ourselves with structural safety of buildings and infrastructure, disaster risk reduction, post-disaster management, that, that was the objectives we wanted to, all the areas that we wanted to be involved. And that would be uh, not through research and innovation like classical projects, but through transfer of knowledge. So uh, we had uh, training and knowledge transfer activities, communication and networking, uh, young researchers for whom uh, there was a training uh, through the PhD degrees. We also we are going to see later also some postdocs. And then of course, uh, dissemination, exploitation, and management. So these were pretty much the things that went on through this, uh, this uh, project. The project was, uh, or the implementation of the project was uh, uh, split in uh, three modules. One for the enhancement of, of the knowledge base and the competencies of the partners, so we had to increase our knowledge. Training and transfer of knowledge, that was another module. And then, of course, uh, we would like these thoughts to stick around for uh, more time, so we had to talk about sustainability, promotion, networking, and, uh, and all these uh, good things that are associated with that. Um, so the, the activities that took place uh, consisted of expert visits, especially at the beginning of the, of the 
is an only project. Uh, experts, faculty from uh, the different partners visited or exchanged visits between uh, all partners to discuss and somehow establish the baseline in Cyprus. You have to know what is going on in Cyprus and where we are. Uh, we did uh, have workshops uh, which basically were utilized uh, for the transfer of knowledge but also the engagement of stakeholders. Uh, short-term scientific missions, this is pretty much secondments for short time of our students to different partners in universities. Summer schools, uh, webinars, virtual trainings. I know some people have uh, attended these uh, virtual trainings and, and other uh, activities also. I, I can recognize uh, faces. Uh, I have to say that this tour was uh, had to run through COVID. So we had, uh, at the initial stages of the project, we had to deal with that. And uh, that, uh, that uh, actually delayed some of the activities. But uh, fortunately, with uh, good spirit and good uh, collaboration, most of the things uh, were accomplished uh, at the end. So we had four uh, virtual trainings um, for, uh, for the range of interest in, in this area for hazard identification, vulnerability analysis, uh, simulation-based disaster risk reduction and planning, pre-seismic checking and risk assessment. All these were topics of virtual training. I will show you later where you can, all these things are available. So you can always go and uh, watch or access them if you, if you wanted to. Summer schools, you had two summer schools, one in Limassol. Uh, the summer schools were utilized uh, for uh, training purposes mainly. So the first one was in uh, Limassol, where we, it was also at the beginning of the project or close to the beginning of the project, where we had to learn the different tools that were provided by our uh, advanced partners and get up to speed so we can also do things uh, as a group and, and especially the Cyprus partners. And then of course the second summer school in in Nicosia, uh, we were more uh, confident and we also had in both, uh, in both summer schools we had survey work but uh, especially the second one in Nicosia we were more prepared uh, for this and I will show you later uh, some of the results. Uh, as mentioned earlier, sh sh STSMs from our students from Greece, uh, Italy, and Cyprus, they went back and forth in different uh, uh, campuses and visited, and uh, they were trained by the uh, local or the host, let's say, partner. So some papers were the product of these visits, training, of course, and knowledge were also. Um, things that uh, came out from these uh, STSMs. Uh, workshops, we had uh, workshops trying to engage the stakeholders. So the first one, especially we got presentations from uh, uh, the various stakeholders, civil defense, geological survey, uh, fire department, uh, water development, um, the meteorology, so we had uh, pretty much from the range of stakeholders had presentations uh, and trying to uh, establish the Cyprus baseline, essentially learn where we stand and who is doing what in Cyprus and, and, uh, and then take it uh, from there. And also we use these uh, workshops for our own training. So there was one workshop uh, in Italy dedicated to successful proposal uh, writing, which was attended by uh, our consortium. Um, so um, after all these activities, uh, as I said earlier, this uh, research group, ISTOS, is, uh, is established. We even have a, a room to house our uh, students, thanks to the university here for providing that. Also, thanks to other colleagues that they were very supportive uh, on this. Um, but anyway, so 
now as it stands, of course we have the involvement of uh, faculty from the four uh, partner uh, institutions. We had uh, some postdoctoral students who were involved in the process, in the training, in the virtual training, virtual trainings and the overall training uh, uh, in, uh, in general. We have five PhD students. Uh, two of them are about to graduate. One of them is in the process. Uh, I should say three are about to graduate and, three, and the others are in the process. So there are uh, PhDs involved. Uh, masters and bachelor students, uh, they were involved at different uh, stages and also uh, took part in uh, the training events, especially in summer schools and our survey work. So um, students at all academic levels were involved uh, somehow in, uh, in this project. Now the competencies that uh, as a group now we have, it's uh, are involved in uh, risk, uh, impact, and uh, we went through all these uh, ingredients for risk hazard, exposure, vulnerability, which I'm sure you're going to listen to the following uh, presentations uh, later. So I'm not going to pack you with this. Uh, this is a risk map for the Agios Domedios municipality. That was a product for, uh, from our second summer school, which uh, among other things, it shows that now we can do things, uh, not just talk about them. Um, to, to do this, uh, um, uh, let's say, risk maps, it involves survey work. We now have uh, this TOS survey form, which we do not claim uh, that we, we started from scratch, took elements from our partners uh, and consultation and how to uh, customize this report and how to utilize it for uh, this work. So now this TOS has its own, uh, its own form. It even has a shorter version, another form which we have developed and it's uh, customized for uh, masonry buildings, um, which is now at our disposal for our survey work. And, and of course, it will be available for someone who wants to see. Uh, these risk maps for risk assessment, uh, as I said, we were fortunate to have partners who had their own methods of doing this. So uh, we learned how to do this in two different ways. One uh, from our the method from our Italian partners, the other from uh, our uh, Greek partners, and I'm sure you, you are going to hear about this uh, later also. Um, and then the, the classical stuff, there were some uh, publications prepared, participated in uh, scientific conferences, and then uh, also issue a bunch of newsletters, I think there are six or seven of them, press releases, uh, some posters, uh, a couple of info days, even participated in the researchers' night, uh, which was uh, very interesting, I have to, to admit. Um, now, um, about sustainability, we do have now uh, stakeholders which we have um, collaboration. These stakeholders range from um, the networks from our partners or our partners, of course, stakeholders, uh, which, uh, as I said earlier, I, I see some of them are uh, present today. And uh, of course, some municipalities. Um, we are involved also um, in uh, research projects. So we were invited by uh, the Geological Survey Department and participate in this uh, Coast Wave project about tsunamis and tsunami ready communities. So there is this effort going on. Uh, Air Force CH is, a, is another project which uh, we were invited from our, some other partners that we had before, some uh, other kind of collaboration and is related to cultural heritage and protection and another one, Climate Empower, which again we were invited from uh, the uh, network of uh, our Italian partners. So Istos is uh, uh, doing some work, 
hopefully it will continue to do this and uh, we move on. Uh, all these things, I don't want to take too much time, all these things that I mentioned, uh, all this information, virtual training, summer schools, um, even uh, uh, newsletters, anything related to Istos, uh, it's all over the internet. We do have a homepage, Istos Center, from where it all begins, and then all the social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, X, Twitter. We even have a, a YouTube channel, which you can access and also uh, to watch some of the presentations. Um, it would, be, would not be fair for me if I didn't finish this uh, presentation without acknowledging uh, the main ingredients. Of course, our partners, our uh, collaborators, uh, our stakeholders who were uh, with us uh, throughout the, the project, either by supporting us with presentations or consultation or just being there when we had our uh, different uh, activities. Of course, the funding agency. I don't know if we have uh, someone uh, participating through Zoom, but of course we have to uh, thank them for providing the means for this project to be realized. And our project officer, who was also very helpful to whatever we have uh, uh, requested. So um, at a glance, that's uh, the project. That's the ISTOS project now, which is now resulted in this ISTOS research group and is ready to move on with other uh, with other uh, endeavors related in this uh, in this um, area or broader subject area of natural hazards. Um, as I said earlier, we are going to have a number of presentations. Um, we can give some of the, uh, questions. So our next uh, presentation is going to be from uh, Professor Meridus Kiriazis Pedilagis and, of course, <laughs> uh, Dr. Eugenia Erich is a, a member of the teaching staff of Aristotle University. Okay, good morning. Uh, the title is latest advances, as you see, but it is Related to the objectives of ISTOS, of course, uh, you will see our our capacities more or less uh, on this uh, on these topics. Uh, we will try to catch up the time. It will not be so easy because yesterday night we went to uh, Zanetos, <laughs> and if you understand that, <laughs> today we are not in a perfect shape. Uh, okay, we will try to do it. Uh, we share between us the presentation, but uh, it is a, a teamwork, and you can see all the people that have been, who have been involved in all these uh, activities and results that you will see. Uh, one of the most important are, are Stefania, is uh, Stefania Fulani, is there, who has done a lot of work here, and he's working uh, closely with with the people here. So uh, it will be in four, uh, let's say, major uh, subjects. A short presentation of the, of the European uh, very recent uh, effort, uh, SHM20 and uh, SRM20. And then you will see the development of the new seismic hazard map uh, in Greece and in Cyprus which is based on, uh, on the work that we have done uh, within these two major uh, European projects. And then some applications uh, for the built environment in Thessaloniki and for critical industrial facilities uh, across Europe. And finally, we will present uh, some work that has been done 
specifically on uh, early warning and real-time risk assessment for school buildings. Uh, a very recent project that is about to finish the risk assessment of schools, which is called the risk schools. And another uh, big issue that, in my opinion, it is something that we have to spend some time more, not only in Europe but everywhere, the systemic approach. The systemic approach because you understand that the hospital may be uh, good after an earthquake, but if the roads are broken, so, and the same is everywhere. So, you will see a systemic approach that has been uh, recently developed uh, in our university with a few others in critical infrastructures at urban scale. So, now I give the floor to Evi and I will. start with a brief uh, outline of the new European Seismic Hazard and Risk Models, the ESHM20 and the ESRM20. Uh, these two models were a product of a big European research project called SERA, where a lot of different partners from all around Europe were involved. Uh, Aristotle University was a part of this project. So, uh, the first model is the European Seismic Hazard Model, ESHM20 which is practically an updated extension of the previous model of 2013. It's a robust, transparent, and fully documented seismic hazard model. It's uniform across all the different national borders, so it covers the whole Euro-Mediterranean region. It captures and communicates the data, assumptions, and model uncertainties. And it is the input to the European seismic hazard model, ESRM20, which we will see uh, next. One of the main scopes of this 2020, additionally, was to support the seismic design code revision activities of, of the specific committee that is in charge of this revision. And this is something that we will see uh, in the forum. So a lot of different data sets uh, were constructed or updated in the framework of uh, the development of ES2020. For example, here we see uh, the unified FQL catalog that was compiled for ES2020. Uh, other such databases were uh, uh, created, for example, for the faults. And the main results are the time independent earthquake ground shaking exceedance rates for, for rock site conditions of VS30 equal to 800 meters per second. So there were a lot of different maps that were developed for different intensity measures, for example, PGA or for some uh, uh, spectral accelerations. Uh, there were hazard curves for a very dense grid uh, for different statistical measures, for example, mean, median, and different percentiles. Uniform hazard spectra were developed for all the different points of the grid, and of course, this aggregation of the hazard results. And all these uh, results, as well as all the input data that were created, are available online for everyone at the website of the fair. Some indicative results of this is 20 are shown here. For example, this is uh, the map of the mean PGA that was um, uh, developed for the whole Europe. We can see with the red color the areas of Europe that have the highest hazard. These are, for example, Greece, uh, the central part of Italy, Turkey, and uh, Romania. Uh, the next model that was created is the European Seismic Risk Model, ESM20 which comprises some different features. For example, it uses as input the European Seismic Hazard Model for the hazard. In addition, a European Site Amplification Model was developed to take into account the site, the local site conditions. This is a model that was inevitably based on some proxy data. Uh, there was a VS30 model which uh, was uh, developed from uh, geology and topography. The European Exposure Model, which contains a distribution of the number of buildings for all the European countries, divided into residential, commercial, and industrial uh, classes. And of course, the vulnerability models, which were developed for each different taxonomy of the buildings to provide the vulnerability and risk uh, results. Uh, here is uh, the European Site Amplification Model that was developed. Uh, a VS30 map is shown uh, on the right-hand side. This was developed from data uh, of topography uh, and uh, um, geology. Uh, 
some examples of the European exposure model, uh, which was developed for 44 countries, including also Turkey. Uh, this was mainly based on national census data from the latest available censuses, uh, but also some uh, more uh, detailed uh, data. And these are, again, everything is available on the website of the fair. For the European vulnerability model, different fragility models were produced. And uh, here we can see some results of the fragility curves and the, and the vulnerability curve for a specific uh, building typology. These typologies are based on the material, uh, the um, uh, number of stories, uh, and of course the code level uh, of each building uh, taxonomy. Some indicative results of the European seismic risk model include maps of average annual economic losses, which is shown on the left, and average annual loss of life, which is shown uh, on the right. Now we move to the next part, which is the new seismic hazard maps that were developed for the national annexes of Greece and Cyprus, based on the results of the new uh, European seismic hazard model of 2020. So, as we know, the seismic hazard maps in Greece have, and in Cyprus have been in force for more than 20 years, so they are probably outdated. Uh, in uh, the ongoing revision of Eurocode 8, uh, there will be some uh, very important changes in how we define the seismic actions. So, there is both a need as well as an opportunity to revise these national annexes now that the new version of the Eurocode 8 will be published. So what we did was to use uh, the results of the recently published ESM20 uh, to uh, propose some new hazard maps for Greece and Cyprus. Uh, just briefly, I want to show how the elastic response spectrum will be defined in the revised Eurocode 8. So here we see uh, the shape uh, of the spectrum. So, the spectrum now will not be based on the PGA, on the deep ground acceleration, but, it, but we will use two new parameters. The first is a say, which is the maximum spectral acceleration at the plateau, at the constant acceleration branch of the spectrum. The second parameter will be a svita, it's the spectral acceleration for a vibration period of one second. So these will be provided for raw conditions by the seismic hazard maps that will be included in the national annexes, and they will be further amplified with proper soil amplification factors, one for S alpha and one for S beta, and also topography amplification factor is uh, uh, included in the um, uh, prescriptions of the new Eurocode 8. Now, ESHM20 uh, had an additional task and that was to provide uh, S alpha and S beta maps for the whole Europe. So what we did was to uh, extract these values for Greece and plot them and see if we can use them to propose a new zonation uh, for the national annex uh, of, the Euro of uh, Greece uh, for the revised uh, Eurocode 8. So here we see these two plots. Uh, the spatial distribution of the median S alpha on the left and of the median S beta on the right, these are both for rock conditions because ESM20 provides S alpha and S beta for rock. So we used these uh, distributions to propose a new zonation, a new seismic hazard map for Greece. Of course, this was, this was a procedure with a lot of different steps. Here we show only the final map that we have uh, proposed. Uh, so we see now that in this map there are five zones instead of the three zones that the current uh, map of Greece uh, has. Uh, for each zone we propose a value for S alpha and S beta. Of course we can also have the PGA, uh, which is uh, computed as the ratio between S alpha and a value of 2.5. And we have also some values for the corner periods that are needed to define the elastic response spectrum. Uh, we have also submitted a paper to Google in Environmental Engineering, and uh, I think that sh soon it will be uh, published. Uh, we also try to do, uh, following the same procedure, to do the same for Cyprus. So here we see the current seismic hazard map of Cyprus. It has two, uh, three, uh, excuse me, seismic zones. 
with the PGAs uh, vary from 0 0.15 to 0 0.25. Again, we used the S alpha and S beta values of VSHN20 for ROC. Uh, here we see the spatial distribution of these uh, two uh, parameters. And uh, to show how the new map was uh, computed, we used uh, an algorithm to categorize uh, this, uh, the Cyprus region into three regions based on the S alpha values for rock conditions. And for each one of these zones, we assign a mean value of median uh, uh, values for S alpha and for PGA. Again, PGA is defined as S alpha divided by 2.5. So this is an initial zonation that was uh, derived based on this uh, natural rate algorithm. And this zonation was uh, in the following uh, a bit um, uh, improved uh, based on some uh, population criteria that we applied and also based on another criterion which had to do with uh, the ratio of uh, the PGA for each one of the uh, biggest and most important cities in Cyprus that is obtained from the zonation divided by the exact PGA that is uh, given by uh, ESG 1020. So we tried so that for these uh, specific uh, cities there are no uh, large uh, differentiations between the value that we proposed for the zone and the specific value that is given by ESG 1020. This was an example of the Yes, uh, we just didn't show the details for the Greek map. So we repeat this procedure until all the criteria that we set are met and this is uh, the final uh, map. Uh, that we have proposed. It has again three zones, as is the current map of Cyprus, but what we see is that these zones uh, differentiate geographically from the ones in the current map. However, the mean, uh, the mean values PGA are more or less the same, so it's 0 0.14 for zone 1 in the northern part of Cyprus, 0 0.20 for zone 2, and 0 0.25 for zone 3, which is at the southern part, part uh, of the country. Again, we provide all the parameters that are needed to estimate the elastic response spectra. I remind that these values are for rock, the same was for Greece, and these need to be further amplified based on the uh, specific site conditions of each site. Now we move to show some applications of VSHM20 and VSHM20. So we will start with an example for our city, for the Saloniki, which is very well documented in terms of both local site conditions and uh, building exposure, and then some uh, more detailed examples for some critical industrial facilities. So, uh, the example that we have included in this presentation has to do with the probabilistic seismic hazard and risk assessment for the Saloniki Greece, uh, where we have a very good knowledge of the local site conditions, thanks to a microzonation study that has been performed uh, by our department in Thessaloniki. Uh, so we compute uh, the expected ground shaking for different return periods, as this is a probabilistic approach. We have uh, a range of periods from 100 to 2,500 years. Uh, in Thessaloniki, we have uh, uh, about uh, 75,000 residential buildings, and this study has been performed just for these residential buildings, so no industrial or commercial buildings are included. And what we did was to perform a stochastic event-based damage analysis and risk analysis using the OpenQuake software. And uh, the vulnerability model that was proposed in the framework of V720 by Romao et al. 2021. Some indicative results include uh, first the results of the PSHA, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. We show here uh, how the mean PGA uh, varies for the different return periods. So we have 100 years, uh, 475 years, 1,000 years, and 2,500 years. Of course, as we move to higher return periods, these values are uh, amplified. Uh, I repeat that these results, uh, in this uh, analysis, the local site conditions have been taken into account, so these are uh, PGA at the ground surface, not for rock conditions. Uh, here are some indicative results from the event-based risk analysis, and what we show here is the so-called loss ratio, which is a ratio of the repair costs, so the cost that is needed to repair the buildings for the 
damage that is estimated, divided by the replacement cost, that is the cost that would be needed to reconstruct the buildings from scratch. So we see again for the different return periods, I have to stress here that these are return periods of the losses, not return periods of the hazard. So we see how this loss ratio uh, increases uh, as we move to higher uh, return periods. We can also see with the red color which are the areas in the city that are expected to, to experience the most uh, severe uh, losses. And another result, that, another result that is derived from this kind of analysis is the so-called loss exceedance curve, similar to the seismic hazard curve that is obtained from the uh, hazard analysis. And here we can see how the expected economic losses, as well as the expected loss ratio, differentiates for the different uh, return periods. Uh, the values for the economic losses here are normalized to the GDP, uh, which was taken from uh, some World Bank data and is equal to about 2,017 billion uh, euros uh, for, uh, for Greece. A similar analysis at a more preliminary, however, level have been performed at national level. So we show here an indicative result for Greece uh, for the economic losses under an exposure to the 500-year return period ground motion. So using some um, preliminary models for the exposure that were adopted from the ESRM 20, we compute a total losses of about 39 billion euros for the whole uh, Greece and a loss ratio of 0 0.0.9. The data that were used here uh, are based on the 2011 uh, census, while the total reconstruction cost for uh, Greece is estimated about 450 uh, billion euros. Uh, now, a similar analysis could be performed for the Cyprus building stock, and of course uh, a focus can be given on the critical buildings and facilities, and especially for Cyprus where there is an existence of detailed microzonation studies for uh, many of the major cities, this would help to have a more accurate evaluation of the site-specific ground amplification and have more uh, accurate uh, results in terms of uh, seismic risk. Uh, here are some examples from the microzonation studies that have been performed for Cyprus, for uh, Limassol, Paphos uh, and Amokustos. Uh, moving to the industrial facilities, uh, the current Eurocode 8 in part 4 uh, partially covers the design of industrial facilities as it, fo it focuses mostly on silos, tanks and pipelines. And what the current practice is, is that there are some recommended values that are provided for the so-called importance factors which uh, amplify uh, the seismic hazard that is calculated for the, for the normal buildings. So, uh, for the most cases, an important class 4 uh, is used for the industrial facilities, which has an important factor of 1.6. This, this means that what we calculate for uh, the ordinary buildings is multiplied by, the, by this importance factor. Uh, it's more or less a way to consider a higher return period for the design of um, important facilities. So, uh, the current uh, code suggests that the national annexes can provide more accurate values for these importance factors and alternatively, alternatively there is also a formula to calculate importance factors for given return periods. This uh, procedure will change in the revision of Eurocode 8. So, uh, in the ongoing revision there will be two possibilities. The one will be to use appropriate return periods. So there is this table which provides for specific consequence classes and for, for specific limit states the um, return periods that should be used for the design of these facilities. Or uh, if there are no available uh, seismic hazard results for these return periods, one can use the so-called uh, performance factors. It's more or less something like the importance factors that are currently enforced. And these are again based on the consequence class and on the limit state. And we see that, for example, for a return period of 2,500 years, the respective performance factor for the significant damage limit state is equal to 1.8. Uh, so uh, we try to see how these new um, 
how this new uh, revision uh, of the Eurocode 8 uh, will affect the desired values for some uh, specific uh, sites where we know that there are industrial facilities. So what we did was to compare uh, two different approaches. Approach one refers to the current uh, practice, which is uh, the hazard uh, for the 455 years multiplied by the importance factor of 1.6. And the second, the second approach is to use uh, the revised Eurocode 8 spectrum, which is shown again here, adopting the S alpha and S beta values from SHM20 for the 510 kilos, and multiplying this by the performance factor of 1.8, which is recommended in the uh, revised uh, Eurocode 8. Some indicative results uh, are shown here. These are um, uh, from a publication in Bulletin uh, of Airport Engineering that we have recently uh, done. So we see it's for the yes for for specific sites where industrial facilities are located in uh, in the whole Europe. So here we see the results uh, based on the different countries that we uh, analyzed, and uh, what we show here is the ratio. <laughs> on the left for S alpha and on the right for S beta. These are the two parameters that are uh, that anchor the response spectrum in the new Eurocode 8. So it's approach two divided by approach one. So it's more or less we show how the adoption of the new Eurocode 8 will increase or decrease the S alpha and S beta compared to the current to the current approach. So we see that the results differentiate based on the, on the country. For example, in Greece, uh, we see that these values are in all cases above 1. So this means that the new approach in the new Eurocode 8 will amplify the hazard for these specific sites. Uh, I have to stress here that in these results, the local site conditions have also been included with a more or less simplified way. But in other countries, we see that in some uh, low uh, seismic countries, such as Belgium or France, we see that these values are below the, the value of 1. And uh, for Cyprus, there is, also, there is one point uh, here where we see that the value for uh, S alpha ratio is below 1, while uh, S beta is around the value of 1. And this is for the Vasilikos uh, power station in Cyprus. Now, Again, using the results of ESHM20, which provides um, hazard maps for different return periods, another thing that we can do is to develop S alpha and S beta maps for higher return periods. ESHM20 has provided these maps only for the 500 year return period because this is what the Eurocode uh, needs. And in fact, this have been included, this will be included in an annex of the revised Eurocode 8 as an acceptable representation of the seismic hazard in Europe. So now we use the hazard results for the higher return periods to produce ma maps of S alpha and S beta for higher return periods. This means that we can now have the actual hazard uh, for higher return periods and use it directly for the design of these critical facilities instead of adopting these uh, performance or importance factors. So this should be something more accurate for the seismic hazard of industrial facilities. Uh, now we will show uh, an example for the Vasilikos power station in Cyprus. And what we did uh, was to assume that we have a hypothetical steel storage tank, which is located at the Vasilikos power station. And we, want, we wanted to check how these different um, um, assumptions for the hazard affect the estimated risk. So uh, for the 2,500 year return period, we adopted three approaches. The first approach is the current Eurocode 8 hazard for the 500 year, uh, years multiplied by the importance factor of 1.6. The second approach is the revised Eurocode 8 with the alpha and the beta values from ESHM20 for the 500 years again multiplied by the performance factor of 1.8. And the second approach is to use the revised real code spectrum directly with the S alpha and S beta values for the 2,500 years, which are obtained from the maps that we showed uh, in the previous, uh, I think, slide. So here we see at the bottom the three uh, figures showing how 
the PGA differentiates from the three uh, different approaches that we adopted. And here we compare the elastic response spectra for both for our conditions uh, on the right and considering side effects uh, on the left, sorry, and considering side effects on the right. Uh, for the BS30, we assumed a value of uh, around 400 meters per second, which was based on the side response model of BSRM20. Again, if we have more detailed data from microzonation studies, as is the case in Europe, we it's can... Yes. 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 Okay, so for this specific example, we see that the three approaches, that there are not significant differences between the three approaches. Uh, this is something that we saw also in the a big figure for all the countries where we saw that the ratios for the point disciples was around one. However, this is just a case, and in some other cases, we have seen that there might be uh, important differences between uh, the spectra, depending on which approach we uh, use. And to see how this impacts the risk, for this hypothetical steel storage, storage tank, we use some uh, fragility functions that are available from uh, the HAZUS, uh, the American uh, uh, approach. And we see that uh, depending on if the tank is assumed as anchored or unanchored, there are important differences between the estimated uh, percentages for the different damage states. However, as there are no important differences between the elastic response spectra of the three approaches, we see that depending on the approach, the uh, percentages do not alter uh, significantly. Safe schools, uh, an earthquake early warning, and uh, early damage assessment uh, tool for critical uh, buildings and schools. It has been more or less inspired by a big project uh, that we had <coughs> several years ago, uh, coordinated by, uh, by Paolo uh, Gasparini, who is not with us anymore. And we have uh, advanced a little bit because we speak a lot about early warning, but for us, it is not enough. What we want to have is an, a, a, a kind of real-time damage assessment. Not only if I will have an earthquake big or not big and whatever, but how it will affect a critical building like a school. So to estimate in real time the level of the damages. So it is a combination of early warning on one hand and the, the, uh, the damage assessment. And to do this, I'm presenting in this uh, rather a complicated figure, the whole uh, uh, issue. The final thing is within a few seconds to be able in the building to estimate in a school building if it will be in red, in yellow, or green and few seconds after the earthquake. In some uh, countries where the earthquakes are located quite far, this is enough to undertake a lot of measures. If it is uh, close by, in, uh, in 10 kilometers, let's say, it will be very difficult because it will be the shadow area, more or less, where you will not have enough, enough, enough time. But for uh, Cyprus, maybe it is something that could be done easily because most of the activities are offshore and <coughs> 40 kilometers or something. So it is maybe more attractive than in other uh, places. So we combine these two. We have an early warning system which estimates the magnitude and the location. And then we have the real-time risk <coughs> assessment, meaning the damage assessment of the building of interest. Uh, and to do so, we have selected three buildings to uh, validate the whole approach, three buildings which have been uh, instrumented. Uh, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It can be a regional uh, early warning or uh, in situ early warning uh, system. Anyway, it is, it is more complicated than as Petro said, we have not enough time to uh, develop this. The most
most important issue here and for critical buildings is that we should not use generic uh, curves, as we have seen before. Why? Because and all buildings have some peculiarities and have some, let's say, transformation within the years. A, a, a building that has been constructed in the 60s is not the same now, for many reasons. Uh, including the aging effects, the corrosion, and you have this problem here in Cyprus. So we have for the critical buildings like schools to make building specific facility and vulnerability curves. And uh, unfortunately, these curves may be quite different from the generic ones. So for the critical facilities, we have to develop building or structure specific uh, facility cares if we want to make a specific study for a specific buildings. But if we want to, to check, for example, the building stock uh, uh, or the uh, school building stock in Cyprus, of course, then we have either produce for all the typologies specific uh, vulnerability curves or use the generic ones knowing that probably it is not so accurate as it should be. And we can see the building, the uh, building specific fragility curves that we developed for the typologies that we had of the school buildings in Thessaloniki. So the whole idea is to be able, I'm not uh, uh, detailing uh, more, three, four, five seconds after an earthquake started somewhere, to be able to have some uh, signs uh, either with uh, uh, a serine or uh, some coloring, uh, where is the damage level that should be expected for this building? And uh, this period of, of five seconds is probably enough to take some measures uh, for, in this case, for uh, the pupils, for the students, and for uh, the people, of course, it, you can see this uh, in, in, uh, in case of hospitals or, or other uh, infrastructures. For example, with an earthquake of 5.2 in this location that you can see on the, on the right, uh, for these three schools, we can see that two of them will be uh, in yellow and uh, uh, and, uh, and one will be uh, green, so no problem. And all this within uh, six seconds after the initiation of the, of the rupture. Another important thing that uh, we should see here, and probably the same uh, is all over the world, is that the installation of the network for the early warning or for the monitoring is very expensive. Uh, a station is between uh, five and, uh, and 10,000 euros. So it is something that uh, uh, normally we cannot afford it. Uh, if we want to uh, make a, a monitoring of large scale. So we spent a lot of time to uh, develop low cost instruments, which is equally, uh, equally reliable based on, uh, uh, on MEMS, which is the new idea, the new uh, technology that is uh, developed very, very fast. And now we have reached in a level of, of having an accurate instrument and we have installed and checked uh, in Thessaloniki, both in our lab and in real uh, uh, conditions, uh, of, of one-tenth of the previous values with the MEMS. So we can have uh, reliable instruments with 300 to 500 uh, euros on and this is very, very important if we want to go in large scale. Your turn now, again. Uh, another project that is about uh, to finish uh, is uh, the risk school system, uh, which has to do with the risk assessment of uh, school buildings in the region of Central Macedonia, in Greece. So in this uh, system, we developed uh, a smartphone app uh, which can be used for the rapid visual screening of school buildings and uh, an online platform 
where both the results of the rapid visual screening can be seen and also the results of a second level more detailed seismic risk assessment for uh, critical buildings. This has been applied for school buildings but can be extended to any type of critical or uh, even ordinary buildings. Uh, so this uh, can be helpful to evaluate the risk and the retrofitting needs of buildings, to prioritize risk and design seismic risk mitigation programs for the buildings, to plan post-earthquake building safety evaluation efforts, and to improve the robustness of decision-making procedures and risk mitigation strategies. And the methodology of the risk school system is shown here. I will try to explain it in brief. So first, we'll develop a building inventory based on on-site survey uh, available data or even uh, some street view data. Uh, we use this building inventory uh, to perform a rapid visual screening based on technical data, the seismic hazard zone and some geotechnical data. And this results in a grade uh, of this rapid visual screening based on which the buildings are either classified as safe or that uh, a more detailed analysis is needed. And this is what we call the first order vulnerability assessment. Now, there is also a second order vulnerability assessment, which uses the data that were collected to create the building inventory to create an exposure model. We also use some fragility curves and a hazard that is uh, um, calculated for the specific region, taking into account the local site conditions. These three are combined to uh, assess uh, the damage and the loss ratio, and this is what we call the second order vulnerability assessment. Combining the results of the two methods and using some expert judgment, we can finally have uh, the final risk classification of the buildings. Uh, these are some uh, examples from the platform that we have developed. Here we see that uh, someone can see for all the buildings that are included in the platform some statistics based, for example, on the material or, or on the lateral load resistance system or on the period of construction. Uh, regarding the local site conditions, we have developed here for uh, the Central Macedonia uh, what we call a hybrid model, uh, which uh, combines data from uh, the ESRM20 site model, which is based on slope and geology, and data, more detailed data, for example, for the Saloniki, uh, these VSR devices that are included have been taken from the microzonation study. Uh, we use this uh, um, model to compute the seismic hazard. The seismic hazard has been computed for different return periods uh, using the ECHM20 uh, approach. And one can also see in the platform the results of the first level, which is the rapid visual screening. One can see based on the color if the building is safe when it's green, and when it's yellow it means that uh, further analysis is needed. And we also provide the results uh, for the second level using um, specific vulnerability curves based on the taxonomy of each building. Again, the ESRM20 uh, fragility and vulnerability curves have mainly been adopted here. And here is the part where we show the results of the risk. Uh, the results are provided with different filtering, so one can select a, a specific municipality buildings of a specific material, a code level, etc., and of course all the different return periods. And here we use a three color scale, green for the safe, yellow for the uh, moderate, and green for the uh, buildings that are expected to have the most severe damages. Uh, the application that we did for the school buildings in central Macedonia was about 1,700 buildings. We provide here the results for the total uh, uh, percentages for two cases. Above, we see the results for the 500-year return period. We see that we have about 1.2% of the buildings expected to have severe, uh, severe damages, while for the 1,000 year, this uh, percentage is increased to 14%. Finally, to have uh, a prioritization of the buildings that actually need uh, retrofitting, what we do is to combine the results of the two methods. So for the case of the Central Macedonia, as I said, we had a total of 1,700 school buildings. So for these uh, total buildings, we have finally 31 wheel buildings which are considered as first priority, 209 buildings that are considered as, as second priority, 
Probably why all the rest of the buildings are uh, estimated as seismically safe. So we have a total of 240 buildings that uh, are estimated to need uh, retrofitting. <coughs> and here is a map where we show the specific locations of these buildings that uh, uh, are the ones that are characterized as uh, the need for uh, retrofit. And finally, for the systemic. This kind of uh, what we call the, of private utilization is, is very important because it affects everything. Uh, it's sometimes we say only 2% of the buildings. <laughs> yes, but if the 2% is of 10,000 buildings, it is a huge number and a huge uh, cost. And it is not only the economic cost that uh, uh, should be accounted for, but the societal. Because if you want to retrofit these school buildings, you have to move the students. And do you have the buildings to do so? So it is a huge problem. And it is very important to be as accurate as possible the estimation of the needs. And uh, the first order uh, estimation based on uh, something that is used in Italy, in the United States, or in Greece, and in Cyprus as well, is not very accurate. In most cases, we have seen that it is more conservative. The estimation that it is done with this simplified approaches gives at least, in my opinion, from the checking that we have done in Greece, at least a 10% increase from other methodologies. So we have to think a lot about this, and this is a very important issue because it affects everything. Now, what about the systemic approach? Uh, ten years ago, we finished uh, a very important European project, which is called the, 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 it's called the Synergy. A lot, of, uh, a lot of publications. The most important are these two books that you can see in Springer. The problem with this, it affects, we had all kinds of, uh, of systemic approach of all uh, infrastructures. The problem was that it was very complicated as, uh, as, a, as a tool. It was uh, built uh, based on, uh, on MATLAB and uh, finally it was not really used. So what we did recently, we uh, get contact with, uh, with OpenQuick, which is uh, now a platform and a tool that is widely used. Uh, for the moment, is for the only for the uh, only for the buildings, and we had an agreement to implement the methodology in open way, mm -hmm. and it has been done uh, through uh, uh, the work of uh, a student that we had uh, in another European uh, project, Asta Pauden, and now we are quite happy to have. Uh, the synergy approach or the systemic approach in the open quick. And it will be extended to any kind of infrastructures. Uh, and you can see why. Let's take uh, a healthcare uh, system. Let's say the hospitals. And the example that we show here is just for the hospitals. It's not only the hospital itself that should be safe, but you have to know how it would be affected if there is a damage to the water system, to the sewage system, to the electrical power system, to the road system, because from a school to a hospital, you need to go through some uh, roads. And if they are blocked by the buildings that are damaged, so everything will be different. So the whole idea is exactly this, how the systems and the damage of the systems for a scenario or the probabilistic as well, it could be done, will affect some critical facility like uh, the uh, operation of a, of a hospital. And you can see more or less the whole idea here. Again, in Thessaloniki, we have a very good uh, database of all this, so we use it as an example. You can see the water uh, and the electrical and the road system in Thessaloniki. And, and when we say the road system, it's not only the roads, 
but the, also the buildings that are attachment to the roads, because if they uh, uh, damage, then uh, at the level of the damage that we have. So the whole analysis needs to be done for all these kinds <coughs> of systems in order to see how it will affect the accessibility to the hospitals. Of course, you can, uh, and you should uh, take into consideration the local site conditions, uh, which is very important for the hazard, the spatial variability, all these kinds of things, the uh, cross-correlation. Anyway, it's, it's something that it is done internally in open way now. And we selected the 10 most important hospitals around uh, in Thessaloniki. And we will see how they will be affected, not as hospitals, but by the damages that the systems will have to the operability, to the, uh, 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 let's say, uh, use of these uh, hospitals. And we can see H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10. If the points are close to the center, it is very bad. If it is close to the periphery, it is, it is OK. So we can see that some hospitals, two hospitals in particular, H8 and H10, are the most uh, critical and are not well uh, behaved, let's say, if we take into consideration the systemic approach. So the uh, response of the systems to the operation of this, uh, 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 of this, uh, of these hospitals. Uh, so the red one. And then in this rather uh, complicated uh, figure, I will try to explain what is this. Here you have the different uh, systems, the road system, the water system, that affects the hospital. And if the color is very dark, it means that the problem is big. If the color is closely to the yellow, it seems that it is okay. So the water system has no really differences uh, affecting, uh, let's say, the hospital. But the road system affects a lot because of the blockage of the roads, because of the damages of the building. So it is a combination, and we can, with this, we can see that two hosp this hospital and H8 are the most uh, critical, but then it depends on the capacity of the hospitals as well to make the final decision, and the capacity is based on the beds that we have. So in the left side, you can see that probably one of these that was classified in very high, uh, let's say, uh, damage level or most critical, because it is not a big hospital, it is not so important as another one. So it is a combination of the beds, let's say, this, let's say, this criteria, and, and the systemic approach that will give the final prioritization to this uh, kind of, uh, of critical facilities. It is a quite uh, important, in my opinion, with a lot of things that we can do in the, in the, in the future. With this, we spent a little bit more time because of Zanetos uh, yesterday. And uh, I think that you uh, have now uh, a full uh, idea of what has been uh, uh, done in our lab and are related to ISTOS and to what will be after ISTOS as well, uh, Petros. I hope so. Thank you very much. So this is the cascading effect as uh, it is uh, deemed uh, from our partners, from the Netos to the food to the late morning and then long presentations. Uh, so uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, from uh, University of Naples, Federico Segundo, uh, Professor Giulio Zukarov. Uh, he's also the scientific responsible of the Clinic Study Center. He's going to present the crisis at uh,
can be fair trade, Caldera, and then uh, risk assessment activities uh, in the emergency planning and management. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be also an interesting presentation. Thank you, Petros. Uh, so first of all, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's important to introduce my presentation with some few words about why we speak today about crisis at Campo Ferrero Vera. Because of course, uh, this is something that we are now doing in these days. We are uh, during this crisis and uh, we are working together with the civil protection in order to provide them all the information and all the detail to uh, perform the law, first of all, the decree that now is law on Campi Flegrei that foreseen a series of activity. And uh, uh, now, once that uh, the decree of the civil protection will be published, we will be operating on Campi Flegrei to do what? To do all kinds of things that we have discussed in Istos, basically. The idea was to trans transfer our uh, capability, our experience, that is uh, since uh, 2006, I mean, yes, 2006, uh, up to now, and to see how this kind of uh, model of uh, studies and evaluating, of evaluation that we have seen uh, even now from uh, Professor Vidilakis and, uh, and the brilliant Heavy, um, are useful for governance, for governance of crisis, governance of local authorities, governance in the providing uh, investment, incentive, uh, uh, measure of reduction, and a wide program of financing. So all these things, have to be clear, are always affected by huge uncertainty. But it is fixed. It is an uncertainty that is controlled. And all the local authorities and uh, the ministry and, uh, and uh, all the uh, institution likes to have uh, some uh, figures, some quantification of reference for organizing their own work, in spite of the fact that we say, oh, look, this is uncertain. And, but we can give, which is uh, the limit of confidence of this value. This is very important for them. I remember the first time in the 1993 that I presented my first study of risk assessment of a municipality of Benevento, that is a, is a town in Campania, not far from Naples. At the time, there was the Servizio Sismico Nazionale, Mauro knows very well because he introduced me to Servizio Sismi Nazionale. Roberto De Marco, that was at the time the, pre the, 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 the director of this service, of this institution, uh, when I presented this, you remember Mauro, when I presented this work saying, oh look, this is the medium of the value of expected damage, but I have to confess that we have an uncertainty, a living confidence until nearly to 90%. So it was something that I was really scared to say. He said, ah, oh, Brilliant. So we have the order of measure. Are hundreds and non thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, non uh, tens of thousands deaths or, or, or building collapse. So what is uh, useful for this kind of application is uh, uh, the uh, combination of analysis, uncertainties, and uh, uh, local authorities' uh, uh, program that is important. So we have to fit with them which is the best. So what we have done in this project, again, is to show, as uh, Professor Pitilakis, as his team has done, all the tools that we have. We can do this, we can do that, and how can it be done? Like this, like that, okay, make, make an application. We make an application in, uh, in Nicosia, we remember collection of data, okay, and now it's calibrating and so on, so, and vulnerability curves, and how can we fit the vulnerability curves? So all the ingredients of the tools has been analyzed, and this I think that has been XSS. Has been XSS, and I hope that in the future we'll uh, allow this uh, Easter Center to, 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 to carry on this work in Europe, and first of all, with the benefit of uh, giving at the, civil, at the Cypriots civil protection a, 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 a lab that could give all this help and all this. So that's why, speaking with the Petros, Petros say, no, no, but do not speak about what we have done. Our bits and pieces of methodology. Why don't you show all the methodology that you use? Why don't you show how Plinius works, that will be how Istos will work? It doesn't matter if it's a volcanic risk or 
or, or flood or, or, or earthquake or whatever, is uh, how, the, how we have to consider the approach of the organization of the lab for uh, Easter Center. And so why don't not use, uh, well, after a, 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 dis a description of how the Plinius Study Center, that is a center of competence of sea protection, is organized, to show what we are going to do for Campi Flegre, that is exactly one crisis ongoing. Okay, so this was it. So before to start with the, my presentation, I want to thank all my teams. There is here Daniela De Gregorio, Francesca Linda Perelli, Stefano Nardone that remain in Naples, and uh, who else, please? Andrea, Andrea that is there, Andrea Montanino, so, and all the others guys from Plinius Center. Okay, Plinius Center is um, an operative center within a wider center of research that is called uh, Looped, that is uh, a one, one, perhaps is the, the greatest uh, interdepartmental center of research of the Federico II, that is the University of Naples, that has as a goal the um, planning and the, um, the territorial analysis of all the components that are on the territory. So economy, structure, safety, uh, so as uh, the risk, of course, uh, but uh, also veterinary or legislation or many other issues that are not directly connected with us. But uh, the goal is to consider everything can be compared, it can be fit, it can be considered, it can be overlapped to the territory in the system logic. As, a, as a Professor P.D. Lactis was saying. So, uh, Plinius basically uh, works uh, for the Department of Civil Protection with a focus on the volcanic risk. But of course, volcanic risk, as we will see in a few minutes, contain all the risks, all the hazards, as we'll see in a minute. Because volcanic risk, uh, in the next slide you will see, how many kind of different hazards has to be considered. And uh, in the emergency cycle, we uh, try to give uh, information for prevention, preparedness, response, recovery, reconstruction, mitigation. In the middle, there is the disaster management cycle. All these, uh, uh, I mean, box that are here, all these uh, slide of cake, are one important phase of the civil protection action, and they need information from the, uh, from the center of competence, quantification, basically, for all this kind of activity. I have no time to go into detail of this, but this is actually the, 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 the base of, of the activity of civil protection. To do that, we work uh, on these three basic parameters, that is hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, has been already said. So no point to go into detail of these uh, basic parameters. Now, nowadays, these parameters that are the basic one has been accepted also by IPCC, and so from adaptation and climate change. Uh, and this is very important, because if we want to speak about multi-risk, we have to combine, obviously, the same kind of, uh, of uh, parameters. Otherwise, if you speak about such a stability and I speak about hazard, it's difficult to speak and to compare the result and to fix in one single, uh, in one single procedure. Okay, to do that, we have some partner. Because, of course, we are not experts in hazard. Uh, so, our partner is the National Institution of Geophysics and Volcanology, INGV, in Italy. And the IREA, that is a, a section of uh, the National Council of Research, CNR, uh, and they produce a lot of information about hazard. So, return period of earthquakes and uh, ash flow distribution and pyroblastic flow and uh, uplift of uh, paralysis and so on. Many, many information that are very useful for us to carry on uh, our job. Our job is uh, evaluation of the exposure and evaluation of vulnerability. Speaking about uh, volcanic hazard, look how many different uh, phenomenology are included in the volcanic. 
earthquakes are as a precursors because before the, uh, the, the, the eruption there are a lot of earthquakes because of the magma that in flooding the, the ground and, uh, and uh, along the, 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 the faults there is uh, some release of energy, so earthquakes. Ash fall uh, at, uh, at the proximal and long distance gives different effect, but all very, very, I mean, important to, 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 to take into account. From a collapse of, of, uh, of a roof in the proximal area up to disturbances uh, <laughs> as uh, uh, not percorrability of the road because of the ash on the, on the ground and uh, for health, for, uh, for um, conditioning, for uh, fly. So the operation of the, of, the, of the airport and the flights and so on. <clears throat> Pyroplastic flow. Pyroplastic flow in the proximal area could be devastating. Could be devastating because uh, as a dynamic pressure that goes from one kilopascal to eight, seven, eight kilopascal at five kilometers from the vent, that means where the urban of Vesuvius, area of Vesuvius is, but in Campi Flegrei is even worse because Campi Flegrei is a volcano, the caldera is a volcano, and inside the caldera there is Pozzoli, Bacoli, and part of Naples. So, and if there was Frankel Bagley, you remember, that made a, a <laughs> an investigation of perception of risk, and there was an American uh, sociologist, I don't remember who, that helped him to do this job, that uh, going around making an interview, but this was more than 20 years ago. 25 years ago, yeah, walking around and saying, what do you think about the volcanic risk? They said, ah, Vesuvio is there, no, it's very far away. They didn't realize that they were sleeping in the volcano every night. <laughs> Who is active and is even bigger. So, <laughs> so I mean, you see, so the, this is strange, but anyway, this is another, this is another job. Perception of risk, uh, social behavior, uh, and all these kind of things like, uh, Climate change adaptation, social behavior, economy now is more and more integrating. Integrating. So uh, we have a background uh, seismocentric, I say, no? because we started in 1980 or even before studying earthquakes and the effect of earthquakes. And that was, uh, I say, the mother of all the risk science, because pose, at least from an engineering point of view, the base of the approach. Now, after four years or even more, all other signs are coming to that kind of approach. Not anymore index, not anymore susceptibility, but hazard, vulnerability, uh, exposure, and so on. But as you see in the list, there are many other, many other phenomena, like landslide, LAR, tsunami, bomb and missile, Bradicism, the one that is a specific action, that Bradicism is a slow seism. Slow seism, that is Bradicism, come from Latin. From Greek. <laughs> Bradicism, exactly. So it's, it's, a, it's, a slow, it's a slow earthquake. We will see something later. But it's a phenomenon specific of Campi Flegrei. There is another place in the world that we have the same. It depends from uh, composition of, uh, of the ground underneath that created this kind of phenomenon. So exposure, quantitative and qualitative geographical distribution of a risk element, risk element. So it depends what we want to study. People, building, infrastructure, infrastructure activity, cultural heritage within the area, and the condition of the operation of the element at risk damage, altered or destroyed as a result of a natural event. We work on these four uh, basic elements at risk. People, buildings, roads, networks. But of course, many other could be considered. Uh, we, we are not able to study everything. Probably to study each of these, you need experts of each of these. For instance, we, for climate change, play with the evaluation of, in another European project, in the evaluation of a model for impact by heat wave. 
that we applied in Naples and that be used for the for the urban planning of the town. Uh, now the point is uh, how to approach in another field the same kind of logic, <laughs> which is the answer that you. So the heat wave. How you define the heat wave? Three days so on the temperature over 55 degrees. Blah blah blah. And who is the element at risk? People that could uh, increase the rate of mortality. Okay. But then there is also money, the economy, because increase the, um, the production of, uh, of energy, because it's very much energy consuming, because of the, 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 the conditioning and so on. The hospital that are over overloaded uh, by people that time of, spent of hospitalization and a lot of other value that are the disturbances of people that are slower, that, uh, that works uh, and produce uh, less, uh, and so on. So, I mean, this just to give an idea that uh, the systemic approach that uh, Pipilak is proposed is, uh, is, really, is really actual and very much studied around. So, uh, to collect the data, of course, you need a form. You need a form in order to go on the run, around. And that's to be a form that is a bit different from the one that is oriented to the seismic one. We have developed a lot uh, since in 1986, the Benedetti Petrini, you remember, Mauro. How many others, uh, by AEDES, that was for damage as well and not just directly for vulnerability. Up to the Cartes one that we developed within the Redux Consortium that is very specific for earthquakes. In spite of the fact that uh, since uh, Mauro gave to me the the honor to lead the group of the research, I introduce some data that could be useful for volcanic and uh, hydrogeologic impact as well. Uh, we have some colleagues sometimes that say, but, but this is not very useful. Yes, not very useful for you, for seismic, but it's useful for some other. But anyway, Plinius has been developed within uh, the Plinius Study Center, so it's uh, full of this kind of information that are useful for uh, impact by ash falls or the roof, the dimension of the roof, the, 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 the geometry of the roof, the, 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 the structure and so on, the material, I would say, and, and so on. And uh, um, this work uh, has been done uh, with an application in, in Nicosia with uh, some uh, software uh, loaded on tablet and, uh, and uh, smartphone. And we collect the data directly on the scratch, on the, on the, on the site by compiling that, uh, that form that went directly the data in the database and in the GIS. So all this methodology, for instance, has been, uh, that now I'm showing, is uh, exactly done for, uh, for Nicosia with, uh, with the help of... Uh, Agius Remedios Municipality? Yes, Medios Municipality, okay, yes. So, no, ju just to say, because otherwise it seems <laughs> that my presentation is of something else. <laughs> No, well, all the things that I show is uh, within, uh, I mean, the procedure that we wanted to transfer. Now, of course, I'm showing the application to uh, the ISTAS, uh, the, the ISTAT, so the census data are, uh, are combined with the collection of, uh, of data on the, on, the, on the field. Because generally to collect the data on the field is very time consuming, it's difficult that you are able to collect all the building of the town, so you collect a sample, statistics say 10%, but we know that is not enough, so 20, 25% is better. <laughs> we are more confident. For instance, at Vesuvius, we have uh, nearly 50%, 50% of the building around the Vesuvius collected. So around 22,000 buildings collected in, uh, because all the buildings are estimated in 44,000. And uh, of course, we have to combine these two information. The census, that in theory is wrong, because it's collected by people that are not experts. They do not understand in the block uh, if uh, there are two, three, or one buildings. They don't understand sometimes even if it's reinforced concrete or masonry. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties in the field. <laughs> but as the great advantage that this one data for all the town, or for all the region, or for all the country. And this is something that we cannot lose. Okay. 
That's why we developed a procedure that uh, tried to uh, put together these two information with a statistical procedure that now there is no time to go into detail, that uh, tried to correct, to correct on the base of the data collected, comparing with the data by census, col uh, co correct the, uh, the error. And then this correction will be spread out on all the town, on all the region, on all the country. Okay. I will be quick here, uh, Linda, because uh, you introduce a lot of uh, specificity of this uh, procedure, and I want just to transfer these, because to do that, we subdivide the territory in uh, a grid, uh, we discretized uh, with a grid of 250 meter by 250 meter cell, and uh, conscious that the evaluation that we do from outside of the building is affected, also that is affected by uncertainty, uncertainty and uncertainty that we'll go to. We'll try then uh, to combine, uh, after the correction, through the methodology that I mentioned, that is Bing and that we'll be showing in a minute, we then give the results not building by building, because we know that is not uh, I mean, reliable. It could be good, but uh, not, not strongly reliable, but by cell because in the cell uh, we are much more confident. So, to work at the level of cell, you have, of, of course, to do a lot of operation at uh, GIS, at the GIS uh, uh, I mean level, by cutting uh, the uh, census zone, that includes the information, by uh, by correcting the, the building that are overlapping one line of the cell. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, works to do in order to make it uh, reliable in terms of uh, combination of uh, buildings. What is the goal of this? Uh, the goal of this uh, is uh, to achieve uh, a distribution of uh, vulnerability class, the one that we, that we did in Nicosia that you show in your slide. So, cell by cell, which is the percentage of uh, vulnerability class A, B, C, D. Of course, each of these vulnerability class has a different uh, propension to be damaged. A is the weaker one, D is the strongest one. Okay, and uh, attached to each of these vulnerability class, there is a vulnerability curve. Vulnerability curves and vulnerability class show <laughs> exposure because vulnerability class is exposure basically, even if this term of vulnerability creates some problem with the people when you speak. But vulnerability class is, uh, we, we could say, typological class, perhaps it's better, people understand. Different typological class are combined with vulnerability curves and together create the vulnerability model. Because of course, if I collect some data, means that I know which are the, 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 the typology, the element of the buildings that are sensible to the response under such and such vulnerability. So if I'm speaking about uh, ashfall and I'm worried about the collapse that could damage or collapse, I have to focus on the, first of all, on the, on the roof and, and so on. For earthquakes, for all the other, the presence of uh, ring beam, of chains, uh, if are embedded in the corner, uh, for masonry, for instance, uh, and uh, for reinforced concrete, if there's the frame in one direction, and all these kind of things that we, very, that we know very well, that lead us to define typology. So, typological class, A, B, C, D. And combined with that, there is a vulnerability uh, curve. How can we produce the vulnerability curves? Well, <laughs> we have, uh, I mean, two main. Uh, roles to do it, two main uh, procedures. The one is uh, observing the damage in the previous event and make a statistic. So all the buildings that had that typology were damaged according to this excitation, in PGI, intensity, magnitude, or whatever, in this way. That means that uh, some building of that kind will be collapsed, 
some other partial collapse, some other heavy damage, some other no damage, because it could happen. It depends from many things we'll see, from local effect, from direction of the wave, from many, many other factors that could influence the performance of that building. And so using the observing data in the previous earthquakes or previous eruption or previous, you can define the statistic of the damage expected that basically are the vulnerability curves. So at the beginning, you remember, we worked with the damage probability matrix by, by, by Wilson. Uh, anyway, but it's the same with the damage probability matrix uh, is a uh, vulnerability curve dis discretized by value of uh, excitation of intensity or PGA or whatever. Of course, this has, uh, is uncertainty. Oh, the other, the other possibility is to work on the single building. The single building with the method of, of, uh, of, <laughs> of the engineering structure calculation, you can uh, define everything. You can define the, the safety factors of that building for that particular exhibition. But you can imagine this to do for thousands and thousands of buildings. is something very, very, very time consuming and computer consuming is impossible. But uh, if you don't have anything on which you can work, you can, uh, you can uh, define some simplified structure model and to work with the Monte Carlo methods, making a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, analysis with the limit state analysis, and to build up some uh, statistic that is built up by you, by changing a bit the, 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 the beams, uh, or the dimension of the beams, or the reinforced, or, or the, the, the thickness of the wall, or the presence of ring beam, or a, a pinched roof, or whatever. So you change these. Uh, uh, typology, these uh, vulnerability factors, as we call, and you see what's happened accordingly. But it, it takes time. Of, of, but is obviously the only way to do, to perform when you don't have statistics. That is uh, calculating. But observe the calculated vulnerability. Then can be combined in a hybrid approach that are recently very, very frequent to see researchers that work in a hybrid approach. So I work on the base of statistics, but work on simplified limit state models analysis, and then try to see if they fit, they correct some attractor, they move a bit the curves, they play with this kind of things. What I see here is a, a, a synthetic, I will be quick here, a synthetic idea of how it works, uh, the, the models, uh, so, for instance, what you see here is for earthquake vulnerability of ordinary building. Uh, this is an extreme simplification, combination of vertical and horizontal structure. This has been done uh, originally in 1988 by, by Mauro Lurch, uh, uh, Braga Liberatore. They did it the first time. You remember that? It was what, 82? <laughs> 82, yes where they combine the vertical and horizontal structure to assign the uh, strength of, of the vulnerability class, okay? So, masonry or rough masonry with uh, wooden floor is the weaker one, A, okay? Reinforced concrete with, uh, with uh, frame in two directions uh, is D. Is, and then in the middle, all the other concrete. And for each of those, of course, you can define a vulnerability class derived by the observation of the damage in the previous earthquakes. This is interesting also for uh, the <laughs> safety of the road, because the road could be blocked, as has been said, and it is. It's, it's, a, it's, a important, uh, it's an important problem for the um, management of uh, the uh, volcanic uh, crisis, because if the earthquake that are precursor, I remember you, before the eruption, block the road, all the planning of the civil protection plan that foreseen the evacuation of a people when the eruption is approaching, according to the, the, the registration and the monitoring of uh, INGB, uh, became a disaster in the disaster. You cannot move people from the area because 
supposed to be building are blocked. And so this is, again, a, a, a systemic approach that you have to consider. In order to make the evacuation safe, you have to study which are the roads that are most vulnerable, which are the links that are most vulnerable. And this can be done by working on the building that are facing the road that has a buffer of less than 10 meters that can block with the possible ruins the, 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 the roads. And we come out with the, with the little model that gives you the probability according to the vulnerability of the building on the road, that the, that link will be stopping. Ashfall. We see <coughs> Ashfall. But Ashfall, we are saying that we don't have so much data to building up an, a, 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 a statistic of the damage and vulnerability class. So then we operated by simplified calculation and uh, with the test. We were around in the, the Vesuvian area called <laughs> making a load test and uh, up to collapse. <laughs> so people were scared of us. But anyway, we were used, we were able to do many, many collapse tests of a pitched roof, of a reinforced concrete, of a steel roof, of a wooden roof, of different geometry. In order to be more consistent, with the evaluation that we were producing by calculating. You see that here, the typology, so the vulnerability class changed. The previous one were called uh, IS, BS. <laughs> this one is AR, OK, by roof, OK? And so is a uh, wicked pinched wooden roof, a flat start and wooden roof, a fortunate concrete flat roof, plus up to, and so on. So it's another classification, because it's a classification of the inventory according to what we need to know to evaluate this, uh, this data. For Bradisism, we had uh, uh, the fortune, I would say, we were quite lucky, to, after 40 years, to find all the form that uh, they did in the survey in uh, the crisis of uh, 1983. And um, we digitalized all this form. And so we had uh, the observed damage by paralysis in, uh, in Cambridge Ferrari. And, we'll, uh, and we were able to build up some <coughs> curves of damage expected uh, for different uh, typology according to the uplift or the inclination, okay? or the tilt. Uplift and tilt. Um, OK, pyroplastic flow. We had a great experience of Montserrat that erupted in the end of, of the 90s. We had, at the time, of a, a project uh, that was called the Zubius on Boeing. So we had the great opportunity to see. And uh, for pyroplastic flow, you know, pyroplastic flow, the current, ardent current, is uh, something that uh, is uh, at Vesuvius. At five kilometers from the vent where there are building is something that goes at uh, 100 kilometers per hour. As uh, a context of gas uh, that is uh, obviously not, 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 not bearable, is unbearable. <laughs> the temperature is uh, between uh, 350 and uh, 450 degrees. It starts from 1,000 degrees, but when it comes down after five, it, it, it became cooler. Around 350, 400 feet, that is enough to is enough. enough for us. Is enough for us, and uh, the dynamic pressure is between one and six, eight kilopascal. Uh, so, with a density that has uh, between 30 kil kilos per cubic meter up to 50, 60 kilo per cubic meter. So, it's something that is better not to be there. That's why in the uh, area that uh, is expected to be kicked by pyroblastic flow, the city protection uh, <coughs> foreseen the evacuation, the total evacuation of all the area. We are speaking about uh, 550,000 uh, people. Hmm? I read in a book that the exodus was 40,000. So. <laughs> but it was happened by God. <laughs> that 
it was not, not the trivial things. <laughs> okay, but anyway, and on top of that, now because of the ash fall, the senior protection asked us to uh, to evaluate how long it takes when the wind that will be definitely with the very high probability oriented by east uh, start to come the, 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 the ash. Previously, that is the yellow zone, the one that is kicked by us. Previously, the people say, okay, we'll see where it's go, and then we go to hell. But it's not like this, because uh, in the proximal area outside the, 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 the pyroclastic flow area, in three hours, the roof will be collapsing at 80% in some area proximal. So they enlarge the red zone at uh, 850. So I saw the face of Petros means that I have to close. He didn't say anything. Yeah. Okay, so I go very quick. This is uh, the look at the weather forecast by NGV, the plume, and we get out with the damage. This is the platform that is called EASY. Uh, it's the platform that uh, is uh, implemented at the premium study center and uh, indirect at the Pozzoli municipality and uh, at the civil protection in Rome. So they can follow every day according to the weather According to the wind, we can define the number of buildings collapse every day. And the same it happens for, uh, for uh, so we, we arrive at a map like this with the roof collapse. The same with earthquakes. We catch the signal, we define the hazards, the shaking mark basically, and the, the, the damage expected. Okay. Go quick because uh, road interruption. Ah, the road interruption that we provide, there is a procedure that involves the technician on the, on the spot. So we send in real time to the municipality, look, this, 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 this could be blocked. So that they can send in real time technician there and can upgrade, yeah, this is true, no, this is nothing happens, and so on. And this is an important, and this is the probability of interruption. We already discussed on that. The Bradicism, right, so we received every month from IREA and from uh, uh, INGB the uplift of the, of, the, of the area and on, based on that we define a grid with the probability of damage in each grid. The same for uh, pyroplastic flow. That includes also the consideration of the effect of decrease of the strength because of the barrier of the urban barrier of the buildings. Right, to close the uh, activity of Plinius within uh, this crisis, we define with the INGV the line of uh, where the bradicism is affecting, taking in consideration uh, a line that has as a limit of 10 centimeters of uplift, um, we uh, will perform within that area. Oh, okay, according to the data that we already have, that are 4,000 buildings, within the other are 15,000. Our task will be to collect all the 15,000 now. It's starting in a few weeks. But for what I knew already, we are able, with the previous methodology, being safe and so on, to evaluate which are the cells that are most vulnerable. Most vulnerable. And we started from that. So we will do the Plinius form uh, for all the building within that area. And then the Cartis form for seismic that is much more detailed and specific for each building. So we change from the cell to the building uh, because the, the owner of the building can ask, feeling to be in a cell that is very high vulnerable to ask, okay, but my building, how is, how is, okay, and um, the same we will do the pathway of, of the distance, okay, multi-risk, I already discussed about that, the last slide is this, monitoring, we have a program that is called uh, Edifici Sentinella, so guard buildings, now we already implemented in one building, that is a school, Artiago in Pozzoli, since one year, and we have studied a bit uh, in terms of, uh, 
uh, reliability and mm -hmm. how the signal and how to interpret and then it works by Wi-Fi and all these kind of things. And we have no monitored one meeting with the MEMS uh, tool, uh, accelerometer, and uh, now uh, the program will be to uh, enlarge this at wide scale, 30, 40 buildings monitored. And now we are starting with this <coughs> within uh, the same uh, low and the same uh, grid for, uh, for carbon flavor. very expensive, yeah. all the uncertainties are behind this, and uh, it is time for something as well. But now, we have machine learning, artificial intelligence, and a lot of tools. I believe, and I'm sure, that within a couple of years, five years, the whole idea behind the difficulty of having a good exposure will change completely using this tool. So for the young generation and for us as well, we start thinking about this, yeah. uh, but we believe that with the combination of all these capabilities that we have now, the exposure will not be something uh, New that it is so New difficult age. now. Yeah. It will change a lot. <coughs> so sure. just to give you <laughs> a pathway no, to the future. No, no. <laughs> Thank you, Petros. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Uh, it's the first time for me to be in Cyprus. Um, and I hope that uh, I see that uh, this project uh, has been very successful. And uh, I'm very happy that we have the collaboration, collaboration, good collaboration uh, between uh, Cyprus and Italy. I was asked by Petros to uh, give an idea of what is the relationship between uh, science and civil protection in Italy. Actually, my, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the recent past, uh, I was in civil protection for 15 years, uh, although, of course, I am a professor at the University of Naples, Federico Segundo. I, oh, <coughs> I can say I am retired. Uh, uh, it's uh, a few months, and uh, now I am uh, currently I'm the president of uh, the Regulis Inter University Consortium, of which I speak a little bit, but my presentation will be <coughs> focused essentially on the role of the centers of competence in the Italian civil protection system, so I will try to explain how it works. Let me uh, introduce my uh, presentation by uh, re recalling how our society is uh, always under increasing pressure to address disaster risk reduction. Uh, this is uh, in spite of the uh, increasing knowledge all over the world about uh, risks, about uh, the behavior of uh, infrastructure, construction, so on and so forth. <coughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, in spite of the increase of knowledge and uh, uh, for some point of view, from some point of view also the use of uh, this uh, knowledge increase, there is uh, a, 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 an increase of risk because the increase of hazard, the increase of hazard uh, because of the climate change, because also of the proliferation of industrial plants uh, that uh, can uh, favor uh, cascading effects uh, with technological risks. And also, on the other side, there is an increase in uh, vulnerability and exposure, uh, often due to the diffuse and uh, uncontrolled uh, urbanization. So, <coughs> there is a, a question on how science can uh, provide information, can provide products for uh, to favor decision making. and. Uh, the first point I would like to address is uh, uh, which are the protagonists of uh, this uh, uh, possible collaboration. On, on one side we have the scientists 
and on the other side we have the decision makers and uh, uh, I like to distinguish technical decision makers for example the uh, uh, civil protection uh, uh, responsible and uh, the political decision maker or policy makers that uh, will represent the political willingness for uh, uh, disaster uh, risk reduction activities. <coughs> of course, they have to, uh, to uh, operate according to the electoral mandate, <coughs> which is not so much uh, worried about risks anyway. <coughs> so uh, the technical decision makers make manage the entire risk cycle while scientists provide uh, data, products, uh, models, uh, scientific information and advice to uh, support sound decision making. So it, it's not uh, uh, easy to implement the, uh, the, uh, an efficient interplay between uh, them for an effective dis disaster risk management. So <coughs> Here in my presentation, I would like to provide you with an overview of the contribution of science to civil protection, <coughs> focusing especially on earthquake structural engineering for uh, exemplific exemplification uh, uh, reasons, uh, and uh, of course referring to the experience made uh, uh, on a national scale uh, within the Italian civil protection system. <coughs> so focus is in the, on the complex relationship between science and civil protection and uh, its governance. Uh, I will uh, uh, speak of the Italian Civil Protection Competence Centers, uh, which is a network in which uh, the uh, contribution of science is uh, organized for, to provide civil protection with uh, products uh, useful for civil protection activities. So I will show you, just for illustrative purpose, some scientific products. I will not go into many details, but uh, I have to uh, thank uh, uh, Julia that spoke a, a lot about vulnerability, so it is easier for me to uh, go fast on uh, the question that I will uh, try to explain. And uh, I will uh, try to uh, give you some lessons learned and uh, uh, to provide some future perspective and uh, some conclusion on, on this. <coughs> so, CV protection and science. Uh, uh, you know that the disaster risk management cycle uh, is made of four phases, the, to which uh, a fifth phase must be added, which is the reconstruction phase in case of a destructive uh, event. <coughs> so, the first phase is forecasting, that is the identification and study of the possible risk scenarios. The prevention and pre preparedness, uh, which are the measures aimed at uh, risk reduction. <coughs> the emergency management, uh, uh, in case of an, of an event, of a destructive event, uh, there is an integrated and coordinated set of measures and uh, interventions uh, for rescue and assistance of uh, population. And uh, the emergency overcome after the event, uh, the removal of obstacles to, be, uh, to the resumption of no normal living conditions. Reconstruction is normally not uh, a task for civil protection. Uh, it is uh, um, a task for uh, uh, the government of the territory or uh, of uh, an extraordinary commission as it happens uh, uh, always in Italy. <coughs> So I will not speak of the reconstruction phase. Um, just a few uh, words on the Italian civil protection uh, system, uh, which is called National Civil Protection Service, NCPS. And it is made of components. Components are the state, the ministries, uh, the regions, uh, and the autonomous, pro uh, autonomous provinces, and the local authorities, uh, the, the mayors. Uh, uh, then uh, we have the operational structures, among which, uh, first of all, the firefighter corps, <coughs> but also the army and uh, in the, the volunteers. And uh, there are contributing subjects that are, for example, professional orders or public and private companies, but also citizens may contribute uh, to the civil uh, protection activities. 
uh, I uh, want to stress the fact that the scientific community is uh, uh, one of the operational structures, is mentioned among the operational structures, and this is very important. This is uh, uh, written in the uh, civil protection code that uh, was enforced in uh, 2018 uh, in Italy. The previous law on the civil protection was in 1992. Um, it is uh, important to stress that the, co the coordination of the uh, national civil protection system, system or service is uh, uh, made by the prime minister uh, through the civil protection department. Now there is an intermediate figure uh, which is the uh, minister of civil protection which is always in the, uh, in the context of the uh, Prime Minister Office. <coughs> and uh, uh, so I mentioned the Civil Protection Code, uh, uh, which was uh, enforced in 2018. And uh, I uh, also have to, I want also to underline that this is a multi level uh, system uh, with the uh, various territorial level from uh, uh, municipality, intermediate level, regional, let's say, or province level. Yeah, it depends, but in Italy it's uh, uh, regional level essentially, and then the national level. <coughs> I don't want to go uh, in more detail uh, with respect to the management of the uh, emergency situation, but uh, of course there are events that are at municipality levels, the, the events that are at regional level, so they are managed by regions essentially, and then there are events, uh, national events, let's say, and uh, the state, uh, the civil protection department, uh, will uh, coordinate all the actions. <coughs> so, uh, civil protection science. The, the collaboration uh, uh, in Italy dates back, uh, at least uh, in modern times, uh, in, uh, to 1976, after uh, the Friuli earthquakes, the earthquake, or earthquakes, because there were uh, many earthquakes, uh, that occurred in 1976. The formal relationship was uh, established in the uh, law 235 that I mentioned before in 1992. Uh, so uh, the scientific body and research institution, institutions were included as operational structures of the national system. And uh, uh, there is also uh, another important uh, uh, body that was established in that law which, which is the major risk commission uh, that uh, was already uh, working before, but it was established by the law in 1992. Uh, with the, the new uh, civil protection uh, code, uh, uh, there is again the recognition of the important role of the scientific community, and uh, there is a better recognition uh, of uh, this role, especially for what concerns responsibilities uh, uh, that are, should be distinguished be between the science contribution and the decision making. <coughs> so, uh, for what concerns the activities uh, uh, of the scientific community for the uh, national civil protection system, we can, uh, uh, in, the, in the civil protection code, there are uh, four types of uh, activities, as you can see. Uh, type A is uh, routine and operational activities, uh, which means uh, monitoring surveillance of events, uh, the monitoring network of uh, the National Institute of Volcanology and other networks uh, for other risks or other hazards and uh, the development of databases that are useful for uh, civil protection, uh, emergency management, and risk forecast and prevention, so on and so forth. The type B uh, activities are experimental activities that are preparatory, preferentially for the activities referred in point uh, A, so the routine and operational activities. Then uh, there are point C, targeted research, so uh, uh, which is not pure research, is uh, uh, finalized research, but in any case, uh, uh, the, the output of this uh, type of activity is not uh, some products that are immediately uh, used by civil protection, but they should, in, in principle, pass through 
appeared for the first time as those entities that provide services, information, data processing and technical scientific contributions in spe speci specific fields. But, uh, and uh, in uh, 2018 with the code, the so Security Protection Code, uh, there is this definition which is the research bodies and institutes, consortia and the university structures that own and make available knowledge and provide products resulting from research and innovation, which can be integrated in the civil protection activities. <coughs> These are, this is the definition of competence centers in the civil protection code. And you see uh, the, um, the logos of the about 40 uh, civil uh, protection competence center that uh, uh, are, have been established uh, by the civil protection department. <coughs> uh, in principle, there could be also networks of competence centers, and this is very important, especially in, uh, uh, in view of the uh, increasing need to deal with multi-risk problems, uh, because uh, uh, typically civil protection uh, competence centers are have expertise in uh, one uh, or two risks, uh, they do not cover all the risks typically for it. And uh, in order to do that, uh, um, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, center of uh, multi-risk has been established, which uh, uh, includes uh, about 10 or 12 uh, uh, competence centers uh, that are already competence centers for civil protection. <coughs> so, uh, focusing on seismic risk, which are uh, the, the competence center, INGB that have been uh, already uh, mentioned by also by uh, Giulio, uh, just for seismic risk that, but also for, for volcanic risk, for, for both concern INGB. Uh, Relouis, uh, which is uh, uh, competence center for projects in earthquake engineering and technical scientific support in emergency, as well as a youth center which is based on uh, Pavia, and then uh, uh, the National Research Council. The National Research Council is the biggest organization for research in Italy, and uh, it includes many institutions with many uh, expertise uh, for what concerns seismic risk of cascading effect, uh, which. Uh, are relevant to landslides, uh, satellite interferometry, and uh, other technical scientific support in images. Then ISPRA for geological cartography, seismic induced geological effects, and so on. Uh, EMEA for post event rubble management, uh, which is a big problem after an event uh, if you deal with uh, uh, destructive event. The, um, Agency for uh, Space, uh, Italian Agency for Space, uh, for satellite data and uh, uh, various services. So how competence centers, centers can operate for civil protection? Uh, uh, in principle, there are multi-annual agreement um, which give continuity in, in the work of uh, competence centers. And this is very important. <coughs> activities and uh, products are agreed with uh, the civil protection department and uh, uh, co-financed uh, by the competence center. <coughs> <coughs> then uh, uh, another important point, uh, at least from my point of view, is uh, the widest possible involvement of scientific community. Um, with the, uh, with the expertise in the same, uh, in a given topic, or with complementary uh, skills and information. This is, uh, perhaps I will assess again this 
in this uh, problem. But uh, if you are uh, on the side of sea protection, you have to make decision. It is not easy to make decision if you have different uh, opinions on the same problems. And uh, <coughs> making all the experts on the uh, same subject uh, all together and give me one opinion, which is a combination of uh, many opinions, of course, is much better for decision makers than uh, try to. And uh, after an event, there are many people that are all experts uh, in, uh, in the same subject. <coughs> so, uh, then, uh, since uh, <coughs> competence center operate for civil protection, they uh, must have a continuous uh, uh, relationship, uh, so interaction uh, between the work package managers of competence center and the, and the civil protection uh, representatives, and uh, the. And in this sense, there should, there should be many coordination meetings uh, aimed at uh, getting a homogeneous approach between the various uh, uh, operators in the competence center, the, the various scientists, knowledge integration, and uh, especially important the consensus on the results achieved. <coughs> now some examples, uh, especially uh, I will focus on one example of how uh, or some, or some uh, products that have been uh, made for, uh, for uh, civil protection by uh, two competence centers, essentially, for regarding earthquake uh, and structural engineering. Uh, in 2010, in 2003, uh, or 2004, uh, uh, two competence centers were created. Uh, Reluis, uh, which is uh, an inter-university consortium of earthquake engineering laboratories that involves uh, almost all researchers in Italy that uh, deal with uh, seismic, uh, structural, and geotechnical engineering. And uh, it is uh, considered as a map of aggregation. As you can see in, uh, in the map on the right-hand side, you see uh, that uh, uh, in practice uh, all the universities in Italy are involved this is a map, uh, there should be more uh, uh, rectangles uh, in a, in a um, more recent map. Uh, I can tell you that uh, about 40 or 41 universities are involved all over the uh, Italian territories, but now even more because there are some private mm -hmm. universities that uh, collaborate. <coughs> and the uh, new center, which is the foundation uh, with uh, a single operational quarter in, uh, in uh, Pavia with a large experimental facilities. Of course, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the time, uh, a collaboration between Reluis, uh, Reluis and U Center was established uh, under a strong push from the Civil Protection Department for the reason that uh, I told you before because they work on the same subject, essentially, with different, let's say, uh, operational ways. <coughs> and then, uh, uh, being the president of Reluis, I will speak of some activity uh, of Reluis in, uh, in the last years, but uh, in practice uh, uh, in the last 20 years, because there is a continuity, as I told you, of the activities uh, competence centers. So um, the uh, point on which I will, the, 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 let's say, the, the activity that I will stress uh, especially is on the, size, the, on the seismic risk assessment that was made in 2018 by the Lewis, but I will also uh, give you some idea on the uh, studies aimed at improving uh, uh, structural prevention intervention for disaster risk reduction, uh, some activities on uh, the improvement of building codes, and uh, uh, studies uh, on uh, structural health monitoring. Uh, I, I will just speak uh, of uh, uh, the first point. Uh, I, I would like just to uh, give you some idea on uh, uh, improving structural prevention interventions. Uh, uh, it was uh, mentioned by is that uh, the problems of making uh, uh, works 
in a school, but this is the, in every kind of buildings, is that you have to make works uh, uh, typically by moving people in other places. Uh, so uh, this, uh, um, the, the studies on uh, intervention was especially addressed to uh, interventions that uh, do not require to uh, move people uh, away. It's not easy, uh, it's easy at all because in any case you have to, uh, to work through the powders and uh, many difficulties for people working or living in a, in a building. And uh, the other point was uh, the, to make, uh, to combine uh, intervention for seismic risk reduction uh, and uh, for uh, energy efficiency that today is uh, a must uh, all over uh, Europe and perhaps all over the world. <coughs> I, but I will not speak of this uh, work package or this activity. So, um, let me make this uh, just a short pre premise uh, on uh, the, the framework in the uh, international and European at European level. Uh, so referring to the Sendai framework uh, for disaster risk reduction of 2015, uh, you know that understanding risk is the first priority. So <coughs> the importance of science is underlined by the Sendai, fr Sendai framework. But uh, another point that has been has to be stressed is that uh, the decision 1313 uh, of the European Union that was also uh, improved in recent time states that uh, um, member states uh, they must develop risk assessment at national level because uh, this is an enabling condition for the U European Union member states to access to some of the uh, structural funds. <coughs> so it is, uh, it was, uh, it, it is, and it was very important uh, to make uh, seismic uh, risk assessment. And uh, uh, in Italy, uh, previous seismic risk assessment uh, that was made in 2010, and uh, Giulio will uh, remember very well, uh, were used, uh, uh, or are used, are uh, still used, to make, uh, to distribute funds uh, for structural seismic prevention among the 20 regions uh, of Italy. <coughs> so of course the, 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 the funds are uh, given uh, especially to regions with high risk like uh, Sicily, Calabria and Campania in southern Italy because there there is concentration of risk of seismic risk. <coughs> for to improve the seismic risk assessment um, in uh, in the period the previous period of the agreement between the civil protection department and Lewis, uh, many activities were uh, were made. The national risk assessment, of which I will speak in a, in a minute, uh, the. Uh, for, we, for which uh, the IRMA platform was uh, uh, set up, and then uh, uh, now the seismic risk uh, maps upgrade uh, are made within the Mars uh, uh, work package, and there is the CARTIS activity that was mentioned by Julie in order to improve the typological structural characterization, we can see with the in, uh, artificial intelligence, but I, just to, uh, in a bracket, I will say that uh, artificial intelligence, but not made by the informatic uh, or people only. Oh, <laughs> Civil engineers are very important to make well-sounded uh, uh, machine learning and so on. <coughs> and uh, um, then another important project that was or is uh, NTC, RI, NTC, NTC are the uh, national standard in Italy. <coughs> so, uh, for what concerns national risk assessment was carried out 2018, I think that uh, um, it is important to uh, understand uh, the, this consensus based methodology. Um, if you, it is uh, uh, valid for hazard assessment, but also for risk assessment. If you ask uh, uh, 10 experts uh, to make hazard, uh, seismic hazard assessment, uh, you will get 10 different uh, hazard maps 
also much different, and uh, we have experience in that case in Italy. <coughs> so, uh, the same if you uh, go to risk to the vulnerability evaluation. So, uh, in uh, uh, the intention of this national risk assessment of 20. 18, but even in the uh, work that is being uh, that is being done, uh, we try to avoid any difference that uh, is not uh, as this are not needed to uh, keep only the difference that are due to the different approach. And for example, Julio spoke of uh, uh, a hybrid, not not hybrid, hybrid is the last, but. Uh, the, the mechanistic uh, or deterministic approach, uh, the statistical approach, uh, the heuristic approach, and so on. Th there are many approaches for vulnerability assessment. So, but if you have a common data type and a common assumption, so the difference are only due to the approach and not due to different uh, assumptions that uh, can be also questionable. <coughs> These are established at the beginning. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, the scientific richness of having different approach is not uh, 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 neglected. So uh, there can be different vulnerability exposure models from the scientific community and a common database of observed damage. And this is an effort that uh, the, the civil protection made with, uh, uh, with, this, with the competence center, essentially Ruiz uh, and uh, you said that to have a common, you have uh, about 300,000 buildings that were um, inspected after earthquake and uh, all the data are collected in this, uh, uh, in this database. So you can uh, calibrate your models with the I don't know if it is a perfect database, probably not, but it's the same. And uh, uh, just to uh, underline that six research units uh, and 30 researchers who were involved in these uh, uh, activities, and uh, um, <coughs> they mm, set up uh, uh, six vulnerability exposure models, four for mesmeric buildings and two for reinforced concrete buildings, with uh, uh, approaches that uh, are called uh, empirical, analytical, <coughs> empirical is the statistical approach, analytical is the mechanistic or deterministic approach, and uh, an hybrid uh, heuristic model. Um, <coughs> yes, okay, I don't know. I, I haven't seen when I started. It's I have uh, five, ten minutes. Okay. <coughs> Another important point is to establish uh, the same uh, consequence functions. So, so uh, we have an estimation of the damage uh, according to, for example, the uh, European maximum scale. So from damage from zero, no damage up to five, which is total collapse. But uh, uh, from uh, according to someone, for example, if you four means uh, uh, that uh, there are 10% uh, of people uh, dead uh, for other one percent of people, and so if you change uh, consequent function, you get completely different results. <coughs> the the uh, final risk is obtained by the aggregation that is uh, to make uh, principle and weighted mean of the result uh, coming from the different uh, uh, vulnerability exposure approach. These are just to have a look at the results uh, that uh, uh, we obtained in 2018 in terms of uh, uh, fatalities uh, uh, per year. These are, these are annual uh, values. Uh, uh, we, have, uh, we can expect in, average, in the average 500, uh, more or less 500 fatalities per year. Of course, they are uh, distributed, but uh, unfortunately, they are concentrated when the events occur, and uh, uh, injured the uh, homeless uh, in the order of uh, many tens th of thousands, uh, 78,000, 78, which is too precise uh, to be <laughs> a credible number. 
and uh, in terms of cost uh, just for the uh, dwelling buildings uh, we expect uh, in the order of 2 uh, billion uh, per year, 2 billion euros per year. <coughs> and this is a, a map. Um, an important point is that all the research units operate uh, with the same in the same uh, with the same platform that uh, uh, is uh, used to share, to compare, and to combine data, models, and results. So, so all the uh, units operating with the same platform that was uh, uh, set up uh, uh, by by the center, and uh, that there was a continuous comparison uh, among the results of the different units, and the different units could uh, could share, could, could uh, compare the results with the data, uh, the database of uh, of damage uh, uh, coming from past earthquakes. <coughs> I will not uh, go into detail, but of course you can uh, choose different numerical exposure model, uh, choose the type of analysis you can make a scenario analysis or risk condition risk or a condition uh, risk analysis and so on. Um, <coughs> the new project is called Mars, uh, and uh, um, the, the work is uh, in progress. Uh, the, 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 the agreement is uh, almost at the end, uh, so there is uh, the review and update of vulnerability models. Uh, the, the attempt to make uh, uh, regionalization of typologies uh, using the CARTIS data, I will speak in a minute of that. Uh, there will be the introduction of subsoil classes uh, according to quite accurate uh, uh, approach uh, and uh, an improvement of the consequence functions according to real data and uh, uh, the discalculation of special structural types like uh, schools, uh, churches, uh, bridges. There are 26 research units involved and 100 researchers in this uh, uh, work package. Of course, uh, there, is the, the, there was the need to improve uh, the IRMA platform, so there are important uh, implementations in order to make update calculation and also uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, special type structures, uh, so there is uh, an IRMA schools and uh, <coughs> IRMA churches. Uh, Another uh, work package in, the, in, the, in this, in the, in the, in the previous uh, project, uh, uh, was uh, uh, related to CARTIS, it, uh, this is the acronym, uh, which uh, is uh, involved in improving uh, the um, typological definition of buildings according by exploiting the local knowledge. So uh, the approach is uh, uh, based on the compilation of uh, interview-based uh, inventories. Uh, there is an interview with local experts that can give you some uh, information on the uh, building types, on the structural types that uh, you cannot obtain by just looking, uh, because there is a plus and you can't see anything apart from the number of stories, perhaps. <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, um, in order to maximize uh, the, uh, the usefulness of this information, uh, you um, should divide uh, the territory of the municipality in uh, uh, sections, uh, or I don't know in English how to say, <coughs> uh, co compound because uh, uh, if you look at the compound that has been uh, built more or less in the same, in the same period, you have uh, uh, very uh, standard uh, characteristics. Also considering, eventually considering uh, possible uh, subsequent uh, intervention or modification. <coughs> and uh, so uh, you can characterize these compounds from the structural point of view, and then you can make any uh, vulnerability evaluation according to the characteristics that uh, you have uh, uh, considered. And uh, this is very important because, as uh, also Giulio said, 
the uh, census uh, information are quite poor, just the number of stories and the age, uh, and the type of structure that uh, um, is not uh, uh, necessarily uh, reliable. So in Italy, uh, we have about 500 now, 550 uh, <laughs> municipalities that have been surveyed according to the CATIS uh, approach. Um, uh, other inf information that are important in order to establish the cost of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the reconstruction uh, is uh, uh, to collect the data from the past earthquakes uh, relating to direct costs uh, for repair and uh, indirect costs for the population assistance. Um, seven research units are involved in, uh, in these uh, activities and uh, uh, one example is uh, uh, this is called the White Book uh, for the reconstruction after the uh, last earthquake in 2009. And here you see the percent cost with respect to the reconstruction cost according to the level damage DS1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, the scale is always the scale of the European Microsoft scale. So you see, for example, that uh, the third damage level, DS3, as uh, a mean, uh, an average uh, uh, repair cost in the order of 30% of the reconstruction cost. <coughs> so, of course, the DS5 is 100%, which, is, uh, which means collapse, and therefore it must be totally reconstructed. Uh, just uh, a few words on the uh, RIMTC uh, project, uh, which uh, is uh, which uh, was aimed and is aimed at to evaluate the implicit seismic risk of structural design according to the Italian national standard, but uh, recently the, the, the study was extended to also to Eurocode 8, <coughs> because uh, of course uh, we are engineers and we use uh, uh, safety coefficients, um, so uh, if you make an analysis uh, for design, uh, you don't have exactly what uh, what is the real behavior of the structure. You have to uh, take uh, these uh, coefficients apart and uh, <coughs> consider the real or the most probable behavior of this structure. And uh, um, uh, uh, several different types of measuring force concrete, uh, and but also uh, industrial uh, buildings uh, were considered. And uh, uh, an important output is that uh, perhaps it, it can be uh, even uh, easily uh, understood uh, that uh, the um, safety uh, against uh, earthquakes is uh, uh, greater in uh, low, uh, low hazard zones than high, high hazard zones. This depends uh, because there are some minimum um, reinforcements uh, or minimum size for uh, columns and beams, <coughs> and, uh, but also for other reasons, uh, more sophisticated reasons. <coughs> so summarizing, uh, um, there are uh, returns from, uh, for the civil society from this activity, the activity uh, of uh, Lewis, but in general the competence center, um, <coughs> regarding for, for what concerns Lewis seismic risk assessment, structural intervention, improvement of building codes, and also structural health monitoring, of which I did not speak. And, uh, um, but there are also uh, important returns for the scientific community because there is a, a continuous exchanges uh, within and between research groups which improve research. And uh, uh, the, um, in general, uh, the full availability of results, methods, and data for the scientific and the technical community and the substantial growth on the scientific production uh, I think that uh, uh, I don't have a very recent uh, data, but uh, since the start of these projects of Lewis, uh, it's about 20 years, there are 
uh, about up to 10,000 uh, papers, uh, scientific papers, papers that have been published <coughs> using the results of the uh, of these projects. Um, in order to uh, <coughs> to improve uh, uh, the relationship between uh, civil protection and uh, um, and the competence centers, um, I think that uh, uh, the uh, hybrid expert, uh, we call the hybrid experts, the civil servants uh, who have a solid expertise in both research and public administration, that can understand the language of the two fields and also the needs of the two fields, <coughs> and uh, uh, they are they are recognized by by both. I, I think that uh, in, uh, uh, with uh, uh, this interface role, uh, the demands and expectation uh, can be uh, better combined and also time scale because if you ask uh, some uh, scientists to, uh, to give a product, they will uh, uh, delay always because uh, not, this is not perfect now, this is not perfect now, but the decision makers have to take uh, are to have to take decisions and so they cannot uh, wait. <coughs> and uh, um, so, uh, in my experience, uh, I think that uh, someone in civil protection that uh, has experience in the science, uh, uh, scientific world, can be very useful uh, to manage uh, this, uh, uh, this um, delicate uh, interface. Uh, these are uh, the uh, conclusion. Uh, uh, so uh, the first is uh, on the need and the opportunity for the scientific community and the world of reputation to cooperate and develop their interaction capability. <coughs> the second is that uh, the focus of science on the real properties of the society uh, foster and optimize the use of the available resources. I think that uh, in Italy we have uh, good practice on this and uh, um, even uh, again in my uh, experience in the past and in the present, uh, research hubs of, res uh, of uh, uh, scientific activities that permit to involve hundreds of research and uh, to cooperate uh, with other central companies are very important. Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, Renouis uh, is uh, an example with that, that kind of uh, uh, approach. <coughs> uh, the scientific product for civil protection uh, are based on the most up-to-date knowledge and on a wide consensus, and I told you about the importance of this. It can be well understa understood. And uh, now there is uh, a growing uh, need uh, uh, at all levels for multi-risk uh, approaches and uh, multidisciplinary research. So there is uh, 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 important, but this, this uh, typically happens uh, all over, at least Europe, <coughs> and networking activities among uh, competence centers. Thank you for your, for your attention. To make this happen. This happens. Uh, consider that we is involved 40 universities and uh, about uh, 1,000 uh, professors, researchers, uh, PhD, and so on and so forth. Uh, the number, the um, typical uh, uh, grant for one year is in the order of 3.4 uh, million euros. Which means, anyway, that uh, each uh, research uh, unit uh, work with a uh, few money, uh, 10,000, 15,000 uh, euros per year. But uh, they are very happy because, uh, they yes, they are networking very well. So I think uh, what was presented is a culture way of uh, operating and all these uh, 
uh, synergies between all the actors. I think that was very uh, interesting, uh, at least for us. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, and I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to our experts from abroad. I will try to give you an idea of uh, the post-disaster management through the role of the Ministry of Interior. And you will get a glimpse of what's going on in Cyprus regarding this issue. So, when we are talking, of course, about the disaster management, we are talking about natural and man-made hazards that threaten people, property, the environment, and cultural heritage. And it seems so, all the reports are pointing in the same, in the right way, in the same way, that climate change will increase disaster risk amplifying the impacts of extreme weather events, floods, droughts, and wildfires, unless adaptation and mitigation measures are undertaken. Now, regarding the role of the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry's efforts is responsible for the coordination of local authorities and communities is to re reduce the exposure and or vulnerability to such hazards and to build the capacities for response and recovery and to act during or immediately after a disaster. This is the main role. And to restore the livelihoods, the health and systems, for example, economic or other systems of a disaster affected community. The ministry is not only responsible for the local authorities, so not only municipalities and communities, but it's also responsible for the legislation for urban planning, as well as the building regulations, which are totally related. So one of the reasons why this ministry was responsible for the compulsory implementation that was decided for Euro courts back in 2012 and the introduction of new provisions in the building regulations regarding dangerous structures or structures that will be soon be deemed characterized as dangerous. Uh, we are already working on an amendment on this issue and uh, with the cooperation with the Cyprus Scientific and Technical Chamber for another proposal for a regular inspection for buildings in order to cultivate the culture of maintenance in buildings in Cyprus. The Ministry works together with the Water Development Department for the implementation of the European Directive and the Cyprus Law on Floods. And we have the f second flood, flood risk management plan up to 2027, including 24 actions for prevention, protection, preparedness, and recovery and review. Measures can be both structural and non-structural. Could be, for example, uh, from the town planning department to have certain area to be allowed the water to be penetrated, compulsory, has, you have to have a certain area, for example, that's one measure. Another measure is to have the construction of dams, um, like uh, we have uh, um, temporary uh, storage uh, lakes, uh, water in uh, Engomi area. Uh, we have uh, the central, um, the major, the major project in Limassol. So there are a number of uh, a number of. Uh, measures that uh, are uh, uh, towards uh, these, uh, these uh, actions. Now, the competent authority is the Water Development Department and due to its role, the connection with the uh, local authorities and municipalities, the courting authority responsible for monitoring the implementation of the plan is the Ministry of Interior. There are a number of national plans, but specifically for floods, 
but with severe weather or earthquake, with certain plans, national plans, depending on the event, the ministry coordinates and supervises the actions of the involved ministries, departments, and services in order to manage the consequences of a catastrophic event and to provide relief and assistance to those affected. A great number of services are involved in these plans, in, in these actions, according to the area of responsibility of expertise, for example, public works department, electromechanical services department, police, fire service, National Guard, Health Services, Electricity Authority of Site, Water Boards, etc. As always. And the plan is activated based on the intensity and extent of the phenomenon and its consequences. Regarding the Ministry of Interior, we have the district administrations, which are considered the district Ministry of Interiors, the Civil Defense and the Game Fund that are heavily involved under the coordination of the administration of the Ministry. The Civil Defense, among other things, they provide first aid, rescue, care, feeding, temporary housing, evacuation if needed, and undertakes support and assistance to other governmental services involved. The game fund protection and policing of buildings and facilities, if needed with the police, assistance in setting up assembly areas and caring for evacuees, and provide availability for personnel, means, and equipment for extinguishing fires, <laughs> along with the fire service. But regarding the buildings, key role have the district administrations are responsible for carrying out the assessments of damage to infrastructure and regarding the state responsibility of those that they are of, of state responsibility as well as private property municipalities and communities of their province and inform the Ministry of Administration. And if the event is of small scale, the district administration will take all necessary measures or if needed with the aid of the Ministry administration. So for small scale events, usually a small number of group of civil engineers and technical engineers will proceed with the assessment of damages of buildings by filling a dedicated form, collect the necessary information about ownership, insurance, etc., and use the guidelines from the ministry. What about the policy? The policy is based on the decision back in 2004 of the Council of Ministers on floods, strong winds, and tornadoes. And it is provided with this decision that the restoration of damages to state infrastructure is the responsibility of the government, while for infrastructure of semi state organization or local authorities, it is decided by the Minister of the Interior in cooperation with the Ministry of Finance. Now, financial assistance is given to low-income pensioners and public assistance recipients to repair damage to their home and equipment. And you can see that the total income of the family, together with the stipendies, does not exceed around 900 euros per month. And the financial assistance to ensure homeowners equal 20% of the amount with maximum 9,000 euros. Now, the group of engineers will estimate the financial aid based on this criteria. So this is for small-scale events. The rest of the people are encouraged to apply for insurance schemes. For large-scale events, like earthquakes, fires, floods, or other disasters in large scale, because of the progressive and dramatic change in climatic conditions, Council of Ministers' decisions are taken as an exception to this policy of 2004 based on specific criteria. And the head of coordination for this policy and the implementation is the Minister 
2018. Again, restoration of damages to state infrastructure is the responsibility of the government. But for private infrastructure, financial aid is provided based on approved criteria. This criteria could be for residences, whether they are owned, rented, insured or not, under construction, country houses, etc. Home equipment, business premises, business equipment, vehicles, private or for business. Based on the scale and based on the consequences, it could be decided some of these could be uh, financially provided, uh, aid uh, will provide, but not for all. And you can see here just an example where it was a big event, large scale event, it was for fire and we had up to 10,000 damages assessment was paid and then you can see additional up to 50,000 additional 80% and you can see the numbers here and for business premises again but there were limits 150,000 for residential 250,000 for business premises for private vehicles and for business vehicles as well but this was an example and as I said before it depends on the scale of the event could be much less but could be also like in the 1995 earthquake when the government funded the construction of one to four bedroom new houses now the group of engineers depending on the scale, will be assembled by governmental officers or from the private sector in cooperation with the Cyprus Scientific and Technical Chamber. <coughs> the engineers will hand all the assessments to the district administration, and after analysis, the district officer will notify the minister regarding the scale of the event and the suggestion, or not, for exception from policy. If it's a large event, it will be clear. With the approval of relative Council of Ministers' decisions, the required funds will be secured and the persons affected will be notified for the available financial aid based on the criteria included in the decision. An objections committee in the district offices will examine the cases of objection submitted regarding the financial aid provided. Now, in the case of earthquake, there is a difference. There is a rapid visual check performed from a group of engineers that will categorize the buildings based on structural safety. Also, engineers will be involved for temporary works, if needed, to ensure the structural safety of infrastructure. And civil defense will provide for temporary housing for the people In this case, a reassessment will take place from another group of engineers, I mean in the cases of buildings that were considered unsafe. And if the second group of engineers characterize the buildings as a dangerous structure, then the building control authority is notified as well for actions based on building regulations. Comments. Now, basically, Due to the small scale of Cyprus compared to other countries like Greece or Italy, the direct involvement of centralized bodies is not adopted. And what we are using is we use a similar practice methodology for disasters as Greece is following for earthquakes. But of course, there are differences. For example, for floods in Cyprus, Certain areas are affected, same people, and more frequent, so there are differences. And there is time pressure on the people that they are providing the results, the group of engineers, because the decision making has to be done fast. 
There are arguments that we need to encourage more the insurance schemes uh, for and against. We need to use more technological solutions for the swift assessment of the area affected and the scale of the event. And we need to simplify the methodology. And this has been forwarded to us through a late report, an external report that we asked to be done for this. So for further actions, we need to improve the methodology. We need more training for the engineers, for the government, the private sector, for the assessment processes, to cooperate with other countries to learn lessons and to introduce ICT solutions for assessments, reporting, and analyzing data. Thank you very much. In Cyprus and all these funding schemes. President, no. There are people who are insured, if, I, if my understanding is correct, and, and people who are not. So if someone is insured, he's going to very funded by the, the insurance, and if not, then uh, request funding from the government, or is it, uh, is my understanding correct? If they are insured, they will be covered by the insurance company, but usually there is an excess waiver, which is not given by the insurance company, and this will be covered by the government. But the difference is, someone he will say, why then, should I go and pay every... Yeah, that was my yeah. question. But the, the thing is that the government is not uh, giving the financial aid uh, as much as is the damage. It's giving a, a financial aid which is less than what it costs to repair the building or the defects. So it's, it's, it's uh, uh, a certain amount of money that will provide us as, uh, as an aid, as a financial aid, but will not cover the, the total cost of, of the restoration of, of the repair. So if somebody has either defects on the building or equipment or a car, is a courage to insure it because the money that we get from uh, the government is just the financial aid and not the amount that at the end of the day, we'll have to pay. So it's just an aid. Yes. Thank you. I have a, a, on a similar issue. The big problem that we have in Greece for this funding after an earthquake is the design uh, of the strengthening the reporting and so that we will be based on the code that has been designed to affect the building or the new this is something that it is always a problem. It is a, it is a major problem, that. I mean, it, it's, it's not an easy answer to I know. To that. Do you have something? Yes, yes. Because the last earthquake was in, back in 1996. Uh, I remember since then, in, and maybe Mr. Hirston will uh, have a comment also, we had uh, uh, the repairs uh, be done. Uh, <coughs> Some of them were, uh, of course, the responsibility, all of them were responsibility of the civil engineer who was made the calculations, etc. but it was, they had to follow the seismic code. The new one? The seismic code that was then. Ah, right. Yes, okay. but, but I mean, at the, uh, at the year of the event uh, occurred. But now, if, if they are, uh, for example, we have now, uh, event uh, today, uh, uh, the, the most probable will be to have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some difference in the coefficients that they will use instead of having the two up, apply for today. But this is something that, I don't know, Mr. Juston, maybe. Well, it's a policy, I guess, that, yeah. that uh, the government Still, 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 as I said, it was the 
back in 1996, the last event that we had. So maybe this is a challenge that we will have in the near future to deal with. And in, in Greece, it was decided to follow the one way or the other, to go how it was before, or it to follow again, the... It is again the decision by the government, and uh, in most cases, the funding concerns the level of design that the building had at the moment of the construction. At the construction. So if, we, if it was in 1970s? Yes. yes. So it is something that has a political impact, as you know, and it is not an easy, an easy solution. No. Uh, in most cases, it is done by case by case, I believe, and it will continue like this. The only solution is to make the people to be insured. Uh, in New Zealand, 90% of the, of the residential buildings are insured. So, so there, I believe that the best the policy should be to force the people to be insured and to give some, uh, let's say, some benefits mm -hmm. uh, in order to do so. Otherwise, we will always have this question which is unsolved. Mm -hmm. It might be to be <laughs> interesting to you, but it is a question of insurance, which is a, a very big question, I think, uh, everywhere in the country. <coughs> in Italy, uh, we are dealing with this uh, question uh, perhaps uh, 20 years or, uh, or even more because, you know, we had in Italy 2009, 2012, 2016, 17, <coughs> three big uh, earthquake or earthquake sequence and uh, uh, each time the cost is, uh, is so high for the, for the state uh, in the order of uh, 15, uh, 20 billions of euros, <coughs> and uh, uh, perhaps each time an earthquake occur, uh, occurs, uh, there is uh, the question uh, uh, arises: uh, we should have an insurance scheme and uh, involve uh, the insurance companies in order to have a unified scheme, so there are. Uh, uh, one uh, hypothesis is uh, to uh, to make a, a, an insurance which cover all the natural risk or, or natural hazard or at least uh, uh, earthquakes and uh, uh, floods <coughs> and uh, hydrogeological risk and even because uh, uh, they are complementary in, in, uh, in the geographical uh, because in the plain that we have uh, uh, flood risk in the mountain, we have a, a special earthquake risk. And uh, <coughs> a, 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 another um, possible solution was uh, discussed uh, about uh, making a, a, a compulsory uh, insurance for all the buildings at a low cost because, uh, of course, if you <coughs> unify the cost uh, where there is a high earthquake risk and uh, a small uh, flood risk but in some cases you have a small earthquake risk and a small uh, flood risk uh, in this way uh, the population can feel uh, like a new tax and this is from the political point of view not, uh, not good <laughs> but on the other hand if you Oblige uh, uh, an old owner, old, uh, for, for the age owner in the Apennines to, to pay 1,000 euros per year because there is a high earthquake risk. Uh, so it is also a, a, a very big political problem. So <coughs> every time, uh, every three, four, five years, uh, the question arises, uh, but uh, no uh, practical solution has been found uh, up to now. So. Uh, apart from this uh, background that I wanted to give you about Italy, I, I wanted to understand if uh, in Cyprus uh, there is uh, a, a, an obligation to uh, have uh, um, insurance and uh, if the scheme is to have insurance for many uh, risks at the same time 
uh, and how the, the, the insurance scheme, you explained that uh, the insurance will cover up to a certain uh, level of damage, but this is for every risk. Can, can you spend a few words about No, this? it's different, it's not compulsory and uh, does not uh, unify approach from the insurance companies. Uh, one of the measures that we have for the flood management now is uh, to summon the council of the insurance companies and discuss this issue with them. Uh, usually uh, they provide for floods and for earthquakes and some of them they don't provide for floods. Mm. It depends on the area. Now they are you know, familiar with the 38 uh, areas that they are prone to uh, floods, so uh, this is something that has to be taken into account. Um, but of course, these are market driven, and we want to know their position before we go further for any actions. But it's not compulsory uh, yet. Uh, we are working as the Minister of Interior responsible for the uh, for the Lands Surveys uh, Department, the there there is legislation. Now to have also uh, a new legislation regarding the multi-story buildings and the people that they are having community areas, uh, common areas, etc. And uh, maybe something is uh, over there again in order to introduce to the legislation that this must be ensured by the committee of the building, etc. But things are, are yet yet are not in in any motion. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> the first one is uh, regarding the uh, flood uh, risk of, uh, map that we that we have. That is only concentrated basically on areas where they are affected by rivers. But we can see during the late year that there is flooding also in areas where where we don't have any rivers. So that is basically basically the reason because we are building and we are creating hard surfaces. That's the main problem with floods. So I think the most uh, the best solution basically for the new developments is uh, to impose measures how they will treat water to create less hard surfaces. That's a proposal by me. Uh, and I think there are systems, especially sustainable drainage systems. Uh, one thing is this, and my other question is regarding the general protection of uh, infrastructure. Um, I believe that we need to be proactive uh, for the production for the production of infrastructure. And my question is, in Cyprus we have so uh, the important infrastructure concentrated almost at the same place. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the power station in Vasiligo. We have fuel tanks, we have a naval base, we have an FSR now that is going to be built. And I am wondering why have we congested a certain area with so much infrastructure? So with a single event, probably Cyprus will go down. I mean, no power, no nothing in a single event. That's my question. I mean, there wasn't a feasibility study before we go and do all that stuff in a single area. A group of uh, governmental services is to produce uh, uh, a degree that uh, uh, limits the hard surfaces in the areas of construction. So this is one of the, of the measures, as you said, as you proposed before. And um, now, uh, uh, the other question, remind me the other question regarding the same part. Question for Vasilis. No, 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 before, no. before, before that, it was... This two, this two of Okay, uh, now about the Vasilikos area, now that's a, a whole different story. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, actions that they are uh, being done regarding uh, to avoid uh, Floods, as you, uh, you, I'm sure you know, regarding Camares villages, uh, Camares area in Larnaca, and uh, uh, the whole Limassol is uh, 
a lot of a lot of work there in Engomi. I use the medios as well, but uh, the reasons uh, I cannot say about the reasons why this industry, the industries that you prescribed before, were considered. Uh, I'm not I'm not responsible to to answer for this. Uh, question. I mean, I, I think they have to get a plan internal from the Ministry of Interior. It's not just a, if, first of all, if it's a governmental, you know that there's no need for a government uh, government uh, approval. Uh, they have they have an approval, not an application and uh, a permit. So it's it's a different different story. But there are other issues regarding. Uh, regarding policing the place and uh, having uh, fire service uh, immediately over there and uh, <coughs> but these are issues that uh, uh, if we are talking about the floods in that area I I'm, think I'm, I'm talking about a general natural disaster that it may occur at the, at the same place yes but th that was a strategic decision that was made regarding this issue. I mean, even in the event of war, they only need one missile to bring sight to the hull. Probably two for the rest of the country. It will take more anyway. Yes. The safest place. That's we, we started and that is now coming to an end. Uh, but maybe uh, it also the focus of, of my presentation today uh, will will discuss of possible opportunities uh, to advance and, and uh, evolve the approach to uh, disaster risk reduction and, and, and resilience in general with a focus on climate change, but not only. Uh, so I will present. Uh, uh, some of the concepts that uh, uh, we have uh, integrated in, in the uh, ISTOS uh, approach uh, evolution as uh, opportunity to bridge uh, the geophysical hazard, or resilience to the geophysical hazard with the climate change uh, hazard uh, in the perspective of uh, uh, supporting investment and, and the transformative approach uh, that can help uh, uh, sustaining the development of society also with respect to uh, uh, other goals that uh, are uh, connected to sustainable development and just transition. And, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, is something that is really clearly emerging from the climate, uh, let's say, resilience domain, but it's now more and more uh, connected uh, in, in, in a sort of uh, uh, more uh, open natural hazard perspective, if we imagine how even issues connected to social vulnerability in post-event reconstruction, also for example for earthquakes, is now uh, uh, affirmed as one of the uh, fundamental angles to which approach disaster risk reduction also for geophysical hazards. Um, the thing is that in the field of climate change, the journey was a bit long to uh, reconnect to more stable and uh, uh, robust methodological approaches that we uh, as more in the engineering uh, uh, conventional approach are associated to risk assessment. Um, in the, the R5, which is the assessment report of the intergovernmental panel, in 2008, there was a shift uh, from a sort of, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, approach more oriented to understand vulnerability to climate change uh, to a more uh, 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 general uh, risk assessment framework where the component of other exposure and vulnerability are finally 
uh, uh, put as the cornerstone of, uh, of any uh, impact assessment in the field. Uh, <clears throat> in the newest uh, report of IPCC, uh, uh, the, the, the report has been reaffirmed and confirmed as the only possible way to assess impact from climate change, but also to assess resilience. Uh, in, uh, in this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, view of the same diagram, we see that resilience uh, is a, a sort of band through that encompasses the interconnection between hazard exposure and vulnerability, of course, with the view of reducing risk and impact. Uh, this can be transferred, uh, uh, let's say, theoretically in a concept of multi-hazard approach. Uh, what is important to understand is that if, from one side, uh, the conventional methods that we adopt uh, uh, for example, for risk assessment, uh, exposure and vulnerability analysis, uh, still is uh, uh, the, 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 the basis uh, of the uh, uh, of risk and impact assessment. On the other hand, the resilience uh, goes uh, into a broader dimension where uh, not only the, uh, the reduction of impact from, from natural hazard is taken into account, but uh, a larger view where uh, uh, systemic change and stability of socio-technical system, as we might call them, as our uh, cities and generally our human societies, are seen as an uh, important uh, uh, component uh, to help supporting uh, uh, the, 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 the awareness uh, towards risks, thus reducing potentially the impact, but at the same time delivering uh, uh, a positive effect on society as a whole. Uh, so this, the purpose, I don't really want to read this long sentence, but just highlight uh, what is the, let say, the new framework for climate resi for resilience, I would say in general, that climate change studies is bringing. So while climate uh, change uh, assessment learned a lot from the risk science background, uh, I think that at this point there is something that climate research on climate change can give back. Uh, which is the understanding that climate resilience is not only uh, 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 reducing impact, but really scaling up action to, uh, uh, with the goal of, yes, adapting to a changing condition while reducing carbon emission as mandatory aspect to reduce the potential uh, magnitude of, uh, of climate change and, and related hazard while improving nature and people's well-being. Like, Investment in development should not be separated to investment in decarbonization or adaptation. Uh, the way we have uh, approached it in the past, you see here some results from a, a, a project that ended just before ISTOS and that informed somehow ISTOS uh, in, the, uh, in the connection of uh, uh, climate uh, impact assessment in a more general multi hazard approach. Uh, you see this multi scale from a regional uh, let's say metropolitan city scale to the municipality to single areas uh, up to a 3D modeling. Uh, the importance of supporting uh, uh, transformation and programs, development programs across scale. We have region and metropolitan cities that receive directly funding from Europe, so they need to have current strategies. But at the end of the day, uh, these uh, investments are used uh, uh, even for smaller scale. Uh, intervention that should not uh, uh, deviate uh, in terms uh, of uh, of reaching the expected goals uh, to achieve uh, uh, at uh, uh, then a larger scale of a city of an entire region uh, the, the the objectives. So there are I don't want to enter in the detail of of the approach. Uh, I just want to focus on the fact that uh, to to uh, nurture this uh, this model, this impact assessment model. We really adopted conventional tools that uh, uh, are much more familiar with the geophysical community rather than climate change. So adopting the uh, vulnerability curves, adopting risk uh, uh, damage matrices uh, is something that also helped us to uh, uh, reconnect in terms of quantification of expected impact uh, the <coughs> method of... Oh. Uh, uh, to uh, currently uh, uh, produce assessment for different kinds of risks. When this information is connected to the possibility of transformation of a given city, uh, uh, 
these tools can actually give information about expected performance of targeted project. You see here uh, why we are supporting the, Nap the city of Napoli uh, in, uh, in politics. And in the top uh, image, you see the, uh, uh, a series of projects that are currently under development in the city and the, the, the uh, uh, effect in terms of uh, uh, impact reduction. Clarity was a project that uh, actually was finished before the consolidation of this new approach. So while on one hand we incorporated the geophysical, let's say the more oriented, risk and science oriented approach, we didn't, uh, where the project ended in 2020, we weren't that ready to capture this more holistic approach that uh, together with the climate change adaptation brings decarbonization and sustainability goals. Uh, so the approach is uh, similar to what the ones that we do, for example, for risk assessment, in earthquake risk assessment, where we compare scenarios, the one, uh, uh, the, the baseline scenario, with respect to an adapted state where uh, adaptation measures are introduced and comparing the effect and also the cost. These are uh, different views of, of the, let's say, the same tool operating at different scales. While when we go more to the level of a, of a, of a single neighborhood, this uh, impact information is also translated into more specific guideline, guidelines and comparison of alternative transformation scenarios. Uh, and until um, the level and of uh, supporting specific tasks that are now mandatory in Europe, for example, the EU the CEA directive, uh, which is more and more intertwined with the climate action. All the environmental policy now in, uh, in Europe is more and more intertwined with the goal of uh, uh, climate neutrality and climate adaptation. So uh, uh, on demand, these are uh, examples of uh, uh, different visualization of the output of the modeling tools uh, that have been uh, requested by our counterpart, the local authorities in Napoli, to support specific tasks in planning. For example, you've seen the, uh, the city plan uh, uh, document for specific district, and, and that's more the detailed guideline uh, uh, and comparison approach to a more specific tool that uh, is a sort of exchange with planners and designers to adjust and adapt their project to get the final approval. But as I said, this was uh, 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 an approach that was considering only uh, uh, the, the focus on climate change adaptation, finally integrated with disaster risk reduction. Uh, the emerging concepts are really much more bridging to the uh, uh, urgency of uh, um, connecting resilience and development uh, uh, to something that is a bit, little bit beyond uh, uh, the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is a very interesting image for me, it's coming from uh, USCD, you see Mission Innovation. These are bodies that support the United Nations in delivering uh, uh, advanced uh, development policies. And it is clear that uh, an approach that it's only looking at uh, the impact of events and, 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 and working uh, on uh, measures that allow to reduce the impact, uh, it's something that it's uh, not really uh, going uh, at the level of why these uh, increasing impacts are occurring. And uh, if it is possible to uh, increase resilience without uh, transforming the rules, uh, our relation uh, with the environment has been established now since the Industrial Revolution. So the issues of systemic change and how uh, community behaviors or even uh, uh, different, uh, 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 let's say, uh, powers uh, operate uh, to, uh, to support this, uh, this societal transformation, uh, it's something that goes all, all of a sudden a bit far from our, uh, let's say, uh, body of knowledge and domain, which is much more on the uh, technical solution to transform buildings, open space or infrastructure, but it's becoming something that uh, 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 it's unescapable because in the field of climate change we are increasing understanding how the path we are following now even with the reduction of emission and even with increasing adaptation is still uh, a way too uh, uh, large to be uh, um, sustained by, by, by our societies and there will be part of the world and probably we are not in the worst uh, uh, part of the work of what concerns the socio-economic fragilities, 
there will be suffering more. This will, of course, entail more and more uh, uh, migration of uh, entire population, unbalancing the, 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 the societal system uh, as we know it. Uh, so uh, there is an emerging pressure of combining this uh, more engineering stuff to uh, environmental science domain to acquire all the rules for systemic change. Uh, this, in our work, translated in the, the, a different uh, uh, visualization of what we, we uh, have as, uh, 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 let's say, climate mitigation adaptation solution, uh, reconnecting them to a more holistic uh, uh, framework for uh, uh, systemic change in cities, uh, aiming at paradigms that are fundamentally well known and are circulating now today, like zero carbon, city, green blue city, 15 minute city, circular city, what does it mean? How the same solution, uh, integrated, differently integrated, can deliver more than simply adaptation to climate change, but actually, as you see here, co-benefits for environmental, social, economic aspect, other than uh, CO2 uh, uh, increase. On, uh, the, the newest updates uh, are, uh, of, uh, of, of this general assessment framework are uh, bringing us to uh, work uh, uh, differently on the models and trying to capture together uh, with, the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the important comfort value, for example, in this case for heat, the in fundamental information related to energy and CO2 storage when it comes to uh, uh, building renovation of building infrastructure. Uh, so you see here how we uh, uh, bring these new layers of information. You see city-scale energy consumption for the Napoli uh, case, which uh, is integrated in the other visualization about the uh, effect and impact of, of, for example, of heat wave and flood. Other uh, information that we are adding is the city scale photovoltaic production potential because the renewable increase is what is can bring to a reduction of CO2 uh, linked to energy energy consumption. Um, so as the possibility of integrating and working with nature-based solution uh, to increase the storage capacity. This is uh, 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 another emerging topic, uh, uh, and you all know how even the European Commission is pressing us to understand how nature-based solution can be brought at this level of the city and how they can support uh, 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 disaster risk reduction at all, at all level. The multi-scale uh, dynamics of, of, of the tool is always there because we are confronted all the time with different demands. There are needs for uh, uh, assessing and, and, and defining solution for a single building, but then we have uh, the need for an overview of the city scale. Uh, uh, this is the same, the same thing I know for, for example, for earthquake, where there is a difference in the understanding the best technological option to increase the resilience or the, the, the seismic uh, uh, strengthening of one specific building. But then, uh, 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 and I think it was presented today also, how I can bring this information on a more larger territorial scale to plan for uh, a large investment that occur at uh, uh, up to the to the regional scale. So we are embedding to dif different tools this uh, uh, information uh, to uh, upgrade. Just to say that there is always a constant upgrade in the base that we do in the modeling. And probably uh, to close, the final upgrade that we are looking at and we are working since a while is uh, a. a, a a multi hazard resilience approach where uh, we have an harmonized assessment framework for geophysical and climate related data. That was meant to be quick test for me. Yes, and I have to say that uh, I followed uh, the variable. Uh, I have uh, seen and I have followed all the, the entire variable of the project, and uh, I must accept that. Uh, I'm fully satisfied with the results. Uh, that's why I have signed uh, already the evaluation documents. I would like to wish to the Distortion Research Center uh, to be developed further and to attain all the goals set by the participants. Thank you very much. No, uh, I, I want, uh, on behalf of Maria Police, that was uh, another of the, the advisory board, uh, bring uh, her. Uh, about the fact that today she had another kickoff meeting of another meeting. <laughs> and so she really could not be here, for which she, uh, she is coordinating. So, so no, no, way to be, no way to be here, but uh, she has uh, read all the documents, she's very happy about the 
achievements that we had, and uh, she hoped to have another chance to come here to see you and to meet our, oh, everybody. Okay, and uh, let me let me take two minutes for a, a short comment to the presentation of uh, Batia that I found very very interesting because it's something. Uh, words that I put in my presentation has been conjugated in the detail and to show you how these uh, um, opening of the, of the study of the risk um, twins with the adaptation of climate change or geohazard and climate change together can be effective for the local authorities to make a decision, to make a program, to make a measure of reduction, to make a policy, basically. And um, this is actually the goal of the, uh, of the PNR, that were the, the new generation funds that we have in Italy that found uh, a lot of money, under 15, and you know better than the other 20 billions of, of, of euro for uh, achieve this goal. So to reduce the uh, impact of climate change by conjugating adaptation and all the measures that focus on climate change with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, geohazard, so earthquake, uh, uh, landslide, uh, seism uh, I mean, volcanic eruption and so on. This is really a challenge, and um, I, I believe that more and more the scientific community has to take into account to work together, to work together without creating a silos as actually now uh, commission, European Commission now feel there is a serious of civil engineer and the one of the volcanologist and the one of a climate expert and the one that goes on adaptation measure. All these has to be merged. We have the honor, we have had the honor to substitute because unfortunately he, he died, um, Paolo Gasparini, that was a starting with AMRA a, a, a European project that was called Espresso, that was a supporting action uh, that gave exactly this vision, and was in the proposal of this vision. So we get this, uh, <laughs> this weight on our shoulder, we carry on the two years and a half a project, and we produce a vision paper and guide the line on which Mattia uh, was very much involved, that still uh, gave us uh, the, the, you see, the light, the, 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 the address of uh, how and uh, merge these this two enormous, but uh, as Mattia said, he made other kind of opening, because it's not just the climate change, it's not just the geohazard, but it's also economy, strategy, uh, governance, uh, social, and so on. So, uh, thanks Mattia for your presentation, and um, I want to underline that this that is, a, is a challenge that we all, uh, all the science engineering have to take into account, take into account. So it's not just a system around the seismic problem, it's a system, it's a, it's a system around all the risk. And now this is mandatory, we cannot any longer uh, not be conscious of that, you see. Okay, thank you. Closing, I, I want to thank everybody for coming here, for being here till now. Uh, special thanks goes to uh, our speakers for uh, delivering these uh, very interesting presentations. Hopefully uh, they were useful, they gave food for thought for everybody. I guess who is here is probably interested in uh, this area and probably got some ideas for uh, further work. Uh, as uh, the ISTOS uh, project is closing down, this is actually the uh, concluding event. Uh, I also want to thank the partners for uh, uh, all their work within three years with uh, a lot of effort, uh, time that everybody invested, uh, even through these uh, hard times of uh, COVID, still uh, each uh, uh, person was uh, doing what was supposed to do and eventually we reached this point where at least for us in uh, Cyprus I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak in, uh, on behalf of uh, Nicolas also my colleague from uh, CUT we have uh, learned 
things and we increase our confidences and uh, we are now I think in a much better position to uh, move on and hopefully uh, uh, improve things or at least uh, contribute to this uh, wider uh, subject of uh, natural hazards and mitigation and adaptation and all these good things that we have uh, uh, heard today. So I want to thank you once again. Um, you probably know, but uh, downstairs in the cafeteria we have some uh, uh, finger food, so please feel free to uh, join us. It's a more relaxed setup, obviously, and then we can also engage in uh, some uh, conversations there, hopefully in a, in a more uh, relaxed environment. So thank you very much again. I'll see you downstairs.